I truly appreciate that you are taking this opportunity to listen to this presentation on the biology of belief. I think you will find this information not only illuminating and exciting, but also very empowering. For this is a new biology that we're going to discuss, a biology not based on genes controlling life, but on perceptions controlling life, meaning that how you see life is actually how your biology will respond. To lead into this understanding of the science, I think we should really go back to before science. Because before there was the actual field of science, there were people with ideas that gave us information as to how the universe might work. These people were philosophers. Science is based on philosophy. First, a philosopher would offer an idea of the mechanisms of the universe, and then science would try to see if those ideas actually are real in the world that we live in. So science is actually a proof of philosophy. So therefore, to understand the nature of the science that we live with today, it is really incumbent upon us to go back and understand the philosophical roots that have led to today's world of modern science. Science has actually formulated on philosophies that were created during the Golden Age of Greece. There were two fundamental philosophers that gave us opinions and views of how the world actually worked. One of them was a man by the name of Democritus. Democritus is famous for providing us with the concept of atoms. He coined the word atom as something being uncuttable, meaning the smallest particle in the universe. He said that there are all different kinds of atoms with all different kinds of characteristics. And if you want to understand anything about the world we live in, then you have to look at the physical things that we observe and see what kind of atoms they're made out of, because the atoms would give character to all the physical structure. According to this philosophy of atomism, the world is composed of these physical particles called atoms, and there's nothing in between the atoms that there are physical things and then empty space. So according to the atomists, if you really want to understand the world, just focus on the material existence. In regard to movement, this is what Democritus suggested. He said that actions such as life result from atoms hitting each other in much the same way that a billiard ball will hit another ball and then careen off and yet hit another ball, setting all the balls into action, that the balls being the atoms would start moving. So that, according to Democritus, life is comprised of uncuttable little pieces of structure called atoms, and that movement is a result of atoms colliding with each other. While Democritus was presenting us with a materialistic view of the world, another very prominent philosopher was also giving us ideas. This man was Socrates. Socrates looked at the world, but he saw a duality. He said there are actually two components that comprise the universe. He called one component a vitalistic component, a component based on energy. He said that this vitalistic force represents a form or spirit, that there are shapes and energy before there are actual expressions of matter. According to Socrates, this form of energy is a perfect or ideal form. So he talked about the vitalistic sphere of the universe, the energy form, as being perfect, as compared to the materialistic or physical expression. So, for example, Socrates would suggest that the world of form can have something such as a perfect circle. But then, if I give you a pencil and say, okay, I can imagine a perfect circle, but let me see you draw a perfect circle, this is where it falls apart. When the ideas are then created into actual structure, we lose some of that perfect character. So, according to Socrates, there are two expressions in the universe— the perfect, ideal, vitalistic form, and then the physical reality, which is an approximation, but never as perfect as the real form. So we have a vitalistic and materialistic component. When the age of Greece passed and the origin of Christianity started to take over the minds of people in Western civilization, science was also brought into the church. However, in the science of the church, it had to depend on which of the philosophies was going to be followed, that of Democritus or that of Socrates. As you realize, the church ultimately selected Socrates' concept of the world, that there was an invisible, vitalistic, spiritual component as well as a physical component. The church, like Socrates, also suggested that the physical component, the one that we live in, the physical world that we experience, is just a crude shadow of really what is the perfect or ideal world. And in fact, this is the teaching of the church, is to not actually be caught up in this crude world that we live in, but to look forward to getting into the more perfect world of spirit and energy.
And this is the foundational belief that the church brought in from the philosophy of Greece. However, while the church was really preoccupied with spiritual issues, it became the teacher of the Western civilization, and that the church ran all the schools. And so in the schools, they taught a science. The science that the church taught was actually a composition of information from the Greek philosophers mixed with spiritual teachings. So, in fact, it was based on the work of Albertus Magnus and Thomas Aquinas to provide us with a mixing of Christian spiritual understandings with Greek philosophical understandings, as well as the Greek science provided by Aristotle. So Christian science was actually a mixture of Socrates, Aristotle, and spiritual traditions. When Albertus Magnus and Thomas Aquinas penned this new science, it was called natural theology. The mission statement of scientists that were teaching natural theology was to gain an understanding of the natural order so that we could live in harmony with it. This is actually a pretty wonderful mission statement. I wish we were using this mission statement today because it really suggested that if you understand the natural order of the universe and understand the physical part of the universe, that we would actually be able to live in harmony with that universe. The scientists that were practicing natural theology were primarily catalogers. They went through the world and identified things, giving names to animals and plants and all different kinds of species. However, much of the science was not really open to investigation. And the reason for that is the church claimed that it possessed infallible knowledge, meaning that whatever it said existed, existed that way because it was really directly from God. This information was not questionable. So scientists were actually restricted in their efforts because if they started to find information that was really not supported by the church, that would go against the infallible character that the church was claiming. So scientists were actually more or less just repeating the dogma that was provided in this natural theology. In fact, much of the universe was actually off limits to scientists because the church considered some areas of life in the universe as mysteries of God and not really amenable for people to look at or for people to understand how they work. For example, the operation of the human body was referred to as a mystery of God. As a result of that classification, people were really not allowed to look inside the human body to see what was in there or how it worked. It was off limits. In fact, it was a sin for a Christian to look inside the human body. Interestingly, because of that, there were no Christian medical doctors. At the time, the only doctors were Muslims and Jews because they were not restricted in their efforts of looking inside at the anatomy and function of the human body. However, as scientists started to expand and start to look at the world, of course they started to infringe upon the infallible beliefs of the church with different pieces of knowledge. Whenever a scientist did show up with something that differed from the church, these scientists were referred to as heretics, and that they actually had to be tried at a court called the Inquisition. The Inquisition would actually be a kangaroo court because nobody could beat the Inquisition court, meaning this, if you claimed you had knowledge different from the church, and the church claimed that it had infallible knowledge, those two would not jive together. So the only way the church can maintain infallible knowledge is to eliminate any dissenting opinion. And this was the role of the Inquisition, that when people would come up with differing ideas on how the universe worked, the Inquisition would force them to recant or punish them. Even burning them at the stake was an option for people who would not recant their heretical beliefs. Well, this was a very interesting situation for an astronomer priest by the name of Nicholas Copernicus, because during his career while teaching at the university and doing his research on astronomy, Copernicus found out that the earth was not the center of the universe, as it was suggested in natural theology. So while the church was claiming infallible knowledge and put the earth in the center of God's domain, Copernicus started to realize that this was not true that the earth revolved around the sun, that the sun itself wasn't even the center of the universe. And now he was in a bind, because while he had the scientific evidence to reveal that the earth was not the center of the universe, that the church was indeed fallible, he was smart enough to realize that by providing this information to the public, he would end up in the Inquisition court himself and then suffer either the punishments or the requirement to recant his heretical views. Copernicus is really a smart guy, though. What he did is he waited until his deathbed in 1543. And as he was dying, he released to the public his book on the nature of the solar system and the movement of the earth around the sun. 
And it was interesting because what he was actually saying to the church was, listen, I'm out of here but you're going to have to deal with this science because I'm leaving that behind. And this put the church in a very awkward position because without anybody to persecute, then they were stuck with the reality of the science that Copernicus offered. And as a result of that, the science revealed that the church was indeed fallible. And when the church was fallible, it meant that it was also open then to question, that scientists could then further question to find out what other fallible things has the church required or what other fallible things has the church offered us that may be different if we understand them. As a result of this ability to ask questions about the universe without the restriction of the church, this represented the birth of modern science. So in fact, the deathbed date of Nicholas Copernicus, 1543, is marked as the beginning of the scientific revolution. Well, science came in, it decided it did not want to offer truth the way the church did, just based on opinion and information that was passed from generation to generation. Science was really trying to say, what is a truth? We have no idea what a truth is. In fact, one of the early philosopher scientists of the day, Rene Descartes, suggested that we throw out all knowledge because he said whatever knowledge we brought forward to this time, no one knows whether it's really true or not, or whether it was just hearsay that was passed on. As a result, throwing out the knowledge that we must provide new truths for the world that we live in. To prevent the kind of truths that sneak through in regard to the religious education, science provided what was called analytical science. Analytical science was based on observing the phenomena of the world, then actually recording all the observations, and then coming up with ideas or hypotheses of how the phenomena that we observe actually occur, and then creating experiments to test those hypotheses. When the hypotheses were correct, things were predictable. If the hypotheses were incorrect, then, of course, they were not predictable. That would lead the scientists to readjust the hypothesis, trying to get a more accurate sense of the truth, all based on predictability. Well, as the church's control over knowledge fell and scientists started to appear, of course, scientists also entertained the philosophy of how the universe works. Some of the scientists were followers of Socrates that believed in an energy world of vitalism behind the expression of life. And then again, there were other scientists who were actually followers of Democritus, who believed that atoms were the central structure of the universe. These people were atomists as compared to the others who were vitalists. The atomists perceived the universe as a physical machine derived from these atoms, the atoms being the smallest parts of the world, each with different characters. And so by understanding the nature of any physical structure and the atoms that comprise it, we would get insight into the character of that structure and the reasons for the actions and reactions provided by it. As a result, scientists started to try to understand the world with these two different divergent philosophies. One of the most prominent scientists to actually shape modern science was Isaac Newton. Isaac Newton was an atomist in this regard because he looked at the world and the universe as a machine. He looked at the movements of the planets and the stars in the skies and suggested that their clockwork actions actually reflected a physical mechanism. In trying to understand the movements of the system, Isaac Newton came up with a new kind of mathematics called differential calculus. And into those mathematical equations, he put the physical characters of the things he was studying, the planets, or for example, the moon. And in the equation, he put the mass of a planet. He put the direction of the movement of the planet. He put the character of gravity, which is a reflection of the size or mass of the planet, and as well, the acceleration of the planet. When he started to resolve these equations, he found that he was able to accurately predict the movement of the bodies in the universe. The significance of this predictability revealed that he fully had a truthful understanding of what was going on in this universe, because predictability is the hallmark of a scientific truth. When he got finished, science took a different view of the world. The vitalists started to recede and decline in numbers. The atomists started to take over the field of science, starting to look at the world as a physical machine. And it was interesting because... With a mission statement of modern science, formerly being the mission statement of natural theology where we were trying to learn to live in harmony with the planet, the new mission statement of science in this mechanistic material world completely changed. For the reason is, if we do perceive the universe as a machine, then it is also very reasonable and logical to recognize that if you take this machine apart and look at its 
pieces, its atoms, its molecules, and its structure, that you would actually get an understanding of how the machine worked. And with this understanding of the machine and how it works, you'd also be able to influence the operation of the machine and the outcome of the machine. So as a result, post-Isaac Newton, the mission of modern science changed to this. It was now designed to obtain knowledge that can be used to dominate and control nature. And this was the expectation that if we lived in a physical world and we knew actually how the physical parts interacted, we could control that world, including humans, because humans, as part of the machine, would also represent a mechanical device. And knowledge of the mechanics of the human would lead to an understanding of how to control human life. For over 200 years after Isaac Newton's original work, scientists kept repeating Isaac Newton's work and looking at his equations and using them to define the operation of the universe. About 200 years later, by the end of the 1800s, around actually 1893, a number of eminent and prominent physicists came to the conclusion that Isaac Newton's equations did describe the universe, that there was nothing new to learn that after this point we actually don't even need any more PhDs in physics because all the rest of physics is just going to use the same equations of Isaac Newton with finer and finer measurements and finer and finer solutions to how the universe operated. So to me it was a very funny and interesting time because it represents something that I call a cosmic joke. To me, a cosmic joke is when you think you actually know something so well that you would actually bet your life, bet your family farm, even throw the kitchen sink into that bet because you know for sure the outcome. And all of a sudden you make the bet and then right in front of your eyes, the answer is something completely different. You're so shocked that you can't even understand how could I miss that. To me, that's a cosmic joke. Well, this is a great cosmic joke because here are the physicists actually saying it's the end of physics. We already know everything about the universe. And this is in 1893. And then the universe throws them a, a big curveball because in two years, new information about atoms starts manifesting. Rentgen discovers x-rays, that energy rays that can actually pass through matter. The Curies come up with an understanding of radioactivity, that atoms release energy and change themselves into different kinds of isotopes, that the permanence and final uncuttable nature of atoms was now in question. There appeared to be something within atoms. Atoms were not the smallest piece of the universe. And as a result... Science started to look for something different. In 1905, Albert Einstein comes up with a solution to explain these mystery energies associated with atoms. In his equation, where he writes E equals mc squared, he's talking about the fact that energy and mass are interrelated to one another. What he actually found, and it was supported by Planck and Heisenberg and other leaders of the field to be called quantum mechanics, is that the atom was indeed not the smallest part of the universe, that inside the atom there were other structures. But as they looked inside the atom, they found that rather than physical things that we thought were in there, such as electrons and protons and neutrons, there were nothing physical inside the atom. The atom was actually small vortices of energy spinning around, that energies in the atom would come and go. Sometimes they were there and sometimes they were not there. This surprising, weird world of physics revealed something that was so profound that even the physicists had a hard time conceptualizing it. The reality is this. If I give you a camera, load it with film, and can shrink you to the size of an atom, and ask you to fly through an atom, and take pictures as you fly from one side of the atom, through the atom, and out the other side. When you come back from this trip, and we start to develop the film and look at the pictures, what you'll see is, there was nothing in there. That there are no physical components inside the atom. The atom itself is made out of energy. And the relevance about that is that all of a sudden it says our whole emphasis on the nature of the universe being a physical world may be wrong. If atoms are made out of energy, and atoms make molecules, then by nature molecules are made out of energy. And if molecules give rise to cells, then cells are made out of energy. And if cells create humans, then humans are made out of energy as well. And all of a sudden, our surety of a world based on matter starts to dissolve, because in the world of quantum physics, we realize that the universe is actually an energy universe completely opposite of the opinion held by Newtonian physicists that perceived of the universe as a physical machine. Well, was quantum mechanics right? Did they really have an understanding of what was going on? The most amazing thing is, for sure it did. Within 20 years, 
of the time that quantum mechanics was introduced into the world of physics and accepted by the physicists of the day as the mechanisms that provide for the world, within that 20-year period, we created the atom bomb. And that was all based on the theories of quantum physicists, so that that theory actually became material in the expression of that bomb. We opened up into the atomic age. This cosmic joke that led us from a mechanical world into an energy world provided us with miraculous advances in our technology. We went from crank phones to cell phones. We went from stethoscopes to CAT scans. We went from typewriters and bottles of whiteout to laptops. All of this new technology derived from the theories based in quantum mechanics. It is now recognized that the theories of quantum mechanics are the most absolutely proven theories in all of science. So that all of a sudden, we really must own the reality of this new world, a world based on energy, not on matter. Through the rest of this presentation, I'm going to focus on a new cosmic joke, a joke that is unfolding in biology right now. The consequences of this cosmic joke will have even more profound impact on human society than the acceptance of quantum mechanics. Because this new cosmic joke reveals something about ourselves, about ourselves as living organisms, how we relate to the environment, and how we relate to life. And why this becomes important for us is because it's knowledge of self. Remember, knowledge is power. Consequently, self-knowledge is self-empowerment. So, to set up this cosmic joke that is unfolding right now, I need to do a little backtracking and go back to the beginning of biology and start from there. It was less than a hundred years after Isaac Newton established the formality of the science of physics, and then biology was created as its own individual formal science. However, Biologists used the physics of Newton to understand the nature of biology. So the very first understanding is that all living things, such as the human body, represent physical machines. And according to the principles of the atomists and Newtonian physicists, it was understood that if you take this machine apart and see all the pieces and how they interact, you would understand how it works. And exactly this was the mission statement of science anyway. Remember to dominate and control nature. So the nature of biologists was to follow through in that mission statement. However, before you can dominate and control nature, and although you see living organisms as machines, a very big understanding had to be found first. And that understanding is, what is it that actually controls the mechanism? Because if you want to control and dominate life, you have to identify where the natural control mechanism is in a living organism, and then that's what you would manipulate to alter the outcome of the living system. At the early days, René Descartes provided us with a concept that there's a mind in a body. And while some people, the vitalists especially, thought that the mind might be the energy, that soul or form that was in some sense controlling the physical body, physicists didn't agree with that. They considered the mind as an epiphenomenon, something that derived from the operation of the physical machine. But the mind itself was energy. And as energy in a physical world, it would not impact matter. That was a given in the rules of atomists, that matter can only affect matter. Since the mind is not matter, then the mind in no way can influence the life of the body in which it resides. So consequently, biologists let go of the influence of the mind on human biology. Even to this very day, it has been very difficult for scientists to incorporate the concept of a mind in the operation of living organisms. Biologists instead wanted to go into the matter of biology, looking at the physical things because somewhere in that physical mechanism, there's a physical thing that actually represents the control. Nobody actually had an idea of what were the physical elements in the physical body that provided for this control. Around 1859, when Darwin released his theory of evolution on the origin of species, he included in there a discussion based on the fact that the organisms in our world carry traits, but the traits of an organism are related to the traits of the parents. And in that time in our history, many, many people were raising plants and animals, animal husbandry, all kinds of new agriculture was evolving, and people were very much involved with breeding plants and animals. So when 
Charles Darwin came up with the notion that the traits of an individual are controlled by the parents, then it became obvious that whatever is controlling the traits of, of a person, for example, must have been provided to them via the germ cells, because that was the physical thing that the parents provided that gave rise to the new offspring. So basically, it was suggested that somewhere in the germ cells, there's going to be some physical component that would end up controlling the traits of an individual. Well, the study of what was in the germ cells started in real intense effort right after Charles Darwin. However, it was around 1892 when August Weismann, a German scientist studying isolated cells, started to see structures that appeared just before the cell divided. These structures were called chromosomes, little thread-like structures that were found in the middle of the cell. And that as you watched the cell, the thread-like chromosomes were split into two groups, and each of the daughter cells received a complete set of these chromosomes. It was suggested by Weissman and then by others carrying out this research that indeed these little units, the chromosomes, represented the physical units of heredity. However, when scientists were able to isolate the chromosomes, they found they were comprised of two different components, protein and DNA. And the issue is, well, which of these components is actually the component involved with carrying the hereditary traits? Nobody was really clear. And while they started to look at how can you identify which one is the trait element, experiments started to be undertaken using cultured cells and isolating the protein and the DNA components from chromosomes. In fact, it ended up in 1944 where the results were finally apparent. For in that year, Avery, McLeod, and McCarty published research that revealed that when working with two species of bacteria, they could actually change the character of one species by employing the DNA from another species. Essentially, they set up petri dishes of species A and then added to these petri dishes either the protein from chromosomes of species B or the DNA from chromosomes from species B in an effort to see if one of those two components would carry the traits of species B into the cultures of species A. In the experiments, they found that the proteins from chromosomes of species B did not affect the morphology or development of species A. However, when they took the DNA from those chromosomes of species B and added it to the cultures of species A, the species A bacteria began to transform, expressing traits of species B. It was then that they fully understood that it was the DNA that was carrying the traits from one species to another. They finally found what they were looking for. They knew that the traits were controlled by something physical. They now found that it was the DNA, and that was the component of the chromosomes. And from then on, we started to look very actively, how can DNA do that? And it was interesting because while it was in 1944 that DNA was discovered to carry the traits, it was only nine years later in 1953 when the understanding of that DNA hit the public. I remember the day myself when that information was published in the scientific journals because it was carried in our newspapers in New York. It was the front page of the tabloid in big block letters that read, Secret of Life Discovered. And it went on to talk about the work of James Watson and Francis Crick discoverers of the DNA double helix. Through their work, Watson and Crick found that the hereditary molecule DNA was a two-stranded molecule that was twisted around each other in a spiral. That when they looked at the nature of these molecules, they were found to consist of only four chemical bases or subunits. That the subunits adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine, which are abbreviated as A, T, C, and G, were the components that comprised these long linear strands of DNA. That these little sequences of the bases, the A, T, Cs, and Gs, actually provided a code. So there were linear codes along the DNA. The use of the code was to create the proteins of the human body. The proteins are a different class of macromolecules. The proteins are very complex molecules. We now know that the human is comprised of over a 100,000 different kinds of proteins. The proteins are very important. The proteins provide for our physical structure, and the proteins also provide for the behaviors that we express. Because proteins are unique molecules. Proteins are molecules that are able to move. So not only do they provide for a physical structure, but as the proteins change shape, their movement provides for 
physiology. It provides for the characters of living systems such as respiration, digestion, excretion, muscle contraction, on and on. All of these behaviors of action are derived from the proteins. So the proteins provide for both our structure and for our behavior. The question, of course, was really important now because while they were looking for the DNA, that physical thing that controlled life, they still had to ask one more important question. What is it that controls the DNA? Well, they really weren't too sure. So in experiments right after the DNA helix was discovered, they found that if they could split the double helix into two parts, into two single helices, and then take each of these single helices and put it into a beaker with subunits, the A, T, and C, and G building blocks of DNA, and just put the single strands into the solution and incubate it. After a short time, when they pulled out the DNA, it had returned to a double-stranded DNA. They found that one strand of DNA would actually be a code to create the second strand of DNA. So all of a sudden, they saw an answer, and they said, Oh my goodness! DNA controls itself. If you take a single strand of DNA and split it into two, each strand would make a complementary copy of itself. Now I'd have two double-stranded DNAs, and each of these strands of DNA could be passed to a daughter cell. So basically it's that DNA possesses codes that program for the complex proteins that provide for our structure and our function. But DNA also has the unique ability to replicate itself. And therefore, DNA appeared to be the end-all in regard to information control in biology. And based on this information, Francis Crick, one of the co-founders of the DNA helix, came up with something called the central dogma. The central dogma is a foundationary pillar under the science of biology. The central dogma reveals this. Information flow in biological systems is a one-way street. It starts with DNA. The DNA is copied into a equivalent of a Xerox version of itself called RNA. That the RNA is the actual physical template upon which proteins are built. So the RNA is the actual blueprint describing the nature and structure of proteins. So basically what this said was the central dogma revealed that while we are indeed protein machines and our behaviors are controlled by our proteins, the character of our proteins and the programming of our proteins comes from the DNA. And basically what we started to recognize is that the character of an organism is pre-programmed in its DNA. And that since the DNA makes the proteins and since the proteins provide for the character, that if you wanted to understand the nature of life or control life, you'd really have to get a handle on this DNA. And as a result... A lot of research in molecular genetics started from 1960s to the 1970s, and it gave us more and more information on the nature of how genes control life. It led to a concept called genetic determinism, which says essentially this. At the moment of conception, the genes from the mother and the genes from the father come together in the fertilized egg called a zygote. And in the zygote, the genes are sorted out, and these genes actually become a program a printout of the future of this organism because the characters in the genes will be represented as the characters of the proteins in the final living organism. So basically what it said was this, is that our fate in some way is absolutely pre-programmed at the moment of conception by the selection of genes that will be activated in our genome. The genome being all of the genes in a single organism. So essentially, the genome biology became the focus of scientists whose mission it was to control and to dominate nature. For an understanding of genes would lead us the ability to change the genes and engineer individual organisms, plants and animals by changing their traits. And then in that way, we would be able to control and dominate nature. There's only one problem with this hypothesis. And the problem relates to how we, as people in this world, deal with our lives. Because what we're being told by science is that we are actually victims of our heredity. For the simple reason is this. We don't apparently select the genes that we have. We can't really just go change the genes that we have and become something different. So we become what the genes are. And since we didn't pick them and have no control of them, then more or less we're a victim. And that the traits in our lives are sort of pre-told and forecast for us in the genome that we came with. And basically it says as you go through life, then you start to recognize that things may be out of your control. 
If your mother had cancer and your grandmother had cancer and your aunt had cancer and you're a woman in that family, it appears that maybe you will end up with cancer as well because these are traits carried by the genes, presumably. That if they're all different kinds of traits, it was even found, for example, that when geneticists were looking at happy people with a question, is there a gene for happiness? Well, sure enough, they split two populations of, of uh, people into an experiment. Happy people and unhappy people. And their focus was, are there genes in the happy people that are active that are not active in the unhappy people? And from that pursuit, of course, they found some genes that appeared to be more active in happy people. And then they came to the conclusion, well, at the moment of birth, the gene that you got covering happiness will determine how much happiness you can even experience in your whole life. This concept of genetic determinization is actually a victimization because, as I mentioned, we apparently had no control over these genes. Well, the problem of victimization and things being out of control uh, is not a big problem for a major industry that obviously profits from this understanding called the pharmaceutical industry. Because the pharmaceutical industry is based on the fact that, listen, you're a victim, you're a machine, you're made out of parts, and if your parts aren't working well, we can manufacture new parts, different parts, and change the operation of the machine. So all of a sudden, we start to recognize not only are we victims of our genes, but there's a way out through pharmaceutical drugs. And today the world is absolutely crazy with drugs controlling everything. Everyday life events that were never really medical conditions are now called medical conditions to sell drugs. And the interesting thing is it is selling us these drugs because we are believing we are victims of our own machine, that we are out of control of that machine. Well, in 1980, the biologist finally said, through all the molecular genetics research, it appears that the contents of the central dogma, the fact that DNA goes to RNA goes to protein, appears to completely understand and describe the nature of life that we experience here on this planet. And as a result, just like the physicists back in 1893, the biologists got a little bit haughty and said, we know it. We know how life works. Everything is, is so clear and understandable. All we need now is one last biology project. It'll be the last project, and after that, all of biology will be understood and manipulated. This last biology project is called the Human Genome Project. Its function? To look at all the genes that comprise a human. And the reason for that is if we could make a compendium, a list of genes for every factor and character of human life, then if someone has a problem, we will perhaps be able to genetically engineer them with a new gene that will compensate for that problem, and we would be able to control and dominate their issues. Of course, the mission statement of science was going to be resolved in this final human genome project. Well, now we finally get to that cosmic joke, the one that's unfolding right now. And listen to this because it's a real exciting moment. And it goes like this. Scientists who already knew how life worked through the genes had recognized this. That for every protein in the human body, you need a gene as a blueprint to make that protein. Well, if we have over 100,000 different proteins, it automatically implied that when the Human Genome Project got finished, we'd have at least 100,000 genes, each gene programming one of the protein building blocks of the human biology. Secondarily, there were other genes that they recognized must exist. Genes that don't actually make protein building blocks, but genes that control the activity of other genes. This form of DNA is called regulatory DNA. And they represent genes that don't make product, but do make control mechanisms. So basically, they said, okay, there'll be 100,000 plus genes to make products, building blocks, proteins, and then another 20 to 40,000 genes that would be classified as regulatory DNA to control the protein-making genes. Well, they did this project between 1987 when it was founded and in 2001 when the results came in. And I remember those results when they came in, looking forward to them to see what they would find. And the answer is, rather than 120 to 140,000 expected genes, they only found 25,000 genes. And this was a major shock, because according to the mechanism, we needed in excess of 100,000 genes. The issue is, how can you explain for human life, human complexity, the characters of mentation and consciousness, and all of the abilities that we express in our body with only 25,000 genes? 
especially when you consider that some of the most primitive organisms on this planet have about the same number of genes. Because before they did the Human Genome Project, they started with other animals that geneticists had been studying. One of those animals is a small little worm that's hardly visible with your eye and has about 1,240 cells. This little organism, with a name longer than the organism, Ceno rhabditis elegans, was found in the first human genome experiments, the prototypes that were carried out on this worm, to contain only about 24,000 genes. And all of a sudden, 24,000 genes felt to be the minimum number of genes to make an animal. They then studied the fruit fly, or the Drosophila. Probably you even did genetic studies on them in school. And the issue about this is that, of course, anything about the genome of the Drosophila would be very useful considering there was a hundred years of research on mating these flies and studying their behaviors. So they look forward to looking for the genome of the Drosophila. And as they had already anticipated before the results came in, that as an organism is, gains complexity, that complexity would be reflected in greater numbers of genes. So while they found 24,000 genes in the Cenorhabditis elegans, they were expecting a lot more genes in the Drosophila. And when the genome project for the Drosophila revealed its results, there were only about 18,000 genes. And all of a sudden, that just threw a big monkey wrench in their thoughts for this reason. How can you make a more complex organism, such as a fruit fly, compared to that little tiny roundworm, the Cenorhabditis elegans, with less genes? It didn't make sense according to the model. And then, of course, when the Human Genome Project came out and found that there were only 25,000 genes, that really shocked them because, my goodness, you can make a whole human with 50 trillion cells and all the characters that come with the human biology compared that to the biology of the little Cenorhabditis elegans, that it takes 24,000 genes to make this little worm and only 1,000 more genes to make the human. Of course, everything started to fall apart. And yet, unfortunately, science really wasn't about to go tell the public about this because the science was very happy to tell the public the Human Genome Project was totally successful. We found all the genes. Well, that is, in fact, the truth. They did find all the genes, 25,000 of them. The unfortunate part is they really haven't said, well, how can you explain biology with over 100,000 genes missing from the model that you require? And this is where... All of a sudden, a new biology comes in, the cosmic joke. They actually thought they knew exactly how life worked, only to find out they were wrong. There were not enough genes to provide for that mechanism that they so believed in. There was actually experiments over a 100 years ago that revealed that genes didn't control life. But those experiments were considered to be an aside, an exception to the rule, and they didn't really want to talk about it. And these experiments a hundred years ago revealed something very interesting. They found that you could remove the nucleus of a cell. And the fact is the nucleus was the organelle inside the cell that contained all the genes. As the structure inside the cell, the nucleus as a repository for the DNA was considered to be the brain of a cell. In fact, many textbooks still refer to the nucleus as the brain of the cell for the simple reason. Since the nucleus contains the genes and the genes control life, then the nucleus as a repository for all these genes would be the organelle that would control life. It would be the brain. And yet what was interesting in these studies over a 100 years ago, they removed the nuclei from cells, a process called enucleation. And what was the big surprise? And that was after they removed the genes, the cells still lived. Some of them could live for two or more months. They just didn't sit there. They ate. They drank. They got rid of waste matter, they moved around, they communicated with other cells, they could avoid toxins, and basically their behaviors were particularly unperturbed by the fact that they had no genes. What you really have to do is stop and ask a question. Well, if you consider the nucleus to be the brain of the cell, then ask a simple question. What is the consequence of taking the brain out of any organism and then throwing it away? And the answer, of course, is death immediate death. And yet, when they enucleated these cells, the cells didn't die. As I said, many of them lasted for two months. They then started to die off after some period of time. Well, the initial point is this. Obviously, the nucleus couldn't have been the brain of the cell because the cells still had a life. They had an integrated, purposeful behavior that they carried out in the absence of genes. So something in the cell must be controlling that cell, but it had to be something other than the genes.
Well, the issue is, what is it that controls life? And this is where the revolution begins. Because once we start to look into what controls life, we move away from the belief that we are automatons, biochemical machines controlled by genes, to recognize that we have very profound powers over the unfoldment of our internal biology as well as the experiences in our external world. To get an understanding of the science I'm going to talk about, it is necessary for us to go back to my introduction into advanced research. Well, I got first interested in cells when I was uh, seven years old and saw cells for the first time in a microscope. I didn't realize that that initial event that mesmerized me would lead me into my career. Years later, I found myself as a graduate student in biology at the University of Virginia. And in 1968, I had the wonderful opportunity of learning how to culture stem cells from my master, his name is Erwin Koningsberg. Irv Koningsberg was the first scientist to create the conditions of cloning stem cells. And this was way back in 1968. I bring that up because today we talk about stem cells as if there's something brand new that just came off the press. And yet I was working on stem cells almost 40 years ago. And it was during those days when Irv was teaching me how to culture these cells that I found my first important lesson that later led to the unfolding of an amazing understanding about cells. This lesson was offered by Irv when I was culturing my first set of cells and was about to put the cells uh, into the incubator. As I was carrying the Petri dishes over to the incubator and I was about to put them in, Irv said to me, he said, Bruce, tomorrow morning when you come in and look at these cells, what I want you to recognize is this. If the cells don't look good, if they don't look healthy, I don't want you to tamper with the cells. I want you to first look at the conditions of the environment. Because over the years, Irv found that it was environmental conditions that seemed to impact the health and fate of the cells in his tissue culture. So I started culturing these cells. And after I finished my PhD and did a postdoc at the University of Texas, I ended up at the University of Wisconsin where I continued my research on cloned human cells and animal cells. And it was there at the university as I started to carry out experiments on these stem cells that I started to realize something very interesting about Irv's admonition about the environment influencing cells. Because as I started to change the environment of the cultures, with very specific uh, references to the components in that culture medium and the conditions of the incubator, I started to realize that I greatly influenced the fate of the cells that I was growing. So, for example, in my experiments, I'd start off with a culture of cells and isolate a single cell, a progenitor cell called a myoblast. A myoblast is a stem cell that, when activated, normally provides for muscle. All of us right now have myoblasts in our bodies. I don't care what age you are, you are sitting with these embryonic-like cells interspersed among your muscle tissue. So if you start to exercise a lot and you need to increase your muscle mass, you will actually activate these myoblasts to, to create a larger population and then contribute to the mass of the muscle that you're exercising. If you damage your muscle, the myoblasts are the stem cells that will actually repair the damage and bring the muscle back into its normal situation. So the interesting thing was that I'm working with these identifiable cells, and I would isolate these cells, put them into cultures by themselves, and from a single cell grow a large colony of cells. All these cells were isogenous, meaning their genes were all exactly the same because they all came from the same parent cell, so these were genetically identical cells. What I found was this. If I take one set of cells and put them into an environment with the standard conditions that I'd been using, of course they form muscle and the cells actually would form mature muscles that would actually contract in the Petri dish. However, if I took cells from the same community, genetically identical cells, and put them into a second environment with different conditions, the cells didn't form muscle but in fact form bone. And then again, if I took cells from the same original culture and put them into a third Petri dish with yet a different set of conditions, these cells would form fat. And at some point I started to realize, while I was teaching medical students at the same time the understanding of the central dogma that genes control life, that DNA goes to RNA goes to protein, and the character of life is controlled and regulated by the DNA, my cells were giving me another insight into the world of life. My cells started to reveal to me that their fate wasn't really determined by their genes, for the fact was all the cells and all the experiments were genetically identical.
But the fate of the cells was really more or less connected to the environment, that whatever the environmental conditions are, they were involved with the selection of the genes that ultimately led to the fate of the cells. So the question was, what was really going on in my cultures? As I tried to get my colleagues to understand this work, which was published in a number of different journals, I found that the reception of this work was not very interesting to them, for they were very much preoccupied with tooling up for the concept of the Human Genome Project that was unfolding at that time, that this kind of work that I was involved with was really more or less, it must be an exception, and we really don't have time to deal with your exceptions, Bruce, so they sort of dismissed my work, and yet I realized as a scientist that the work was repeatable, predictable, it's been published, it's been reviewed by my peers, and accepted as a scientific piece of laboratory research. So at some point, I felt I was a little bit out of integrity because I was getting lessons about life from the cells in the tissue culture that did not in any way correspond to the information that I was providing medical students about how life worked. And as a result of that, I found that it was very, very necessary to not be in that environment. And in fact, I actually resigned my tenured position at the university because I found that I was just not in integrity staying there teaching what I knew to be wrong. And so on my own, I started to continue my studies as to what is it that was going on in my culture? What could I learn from these stem cells? What could I find out about how life is controlled by looking at them rather than just falling into the dogma that everyone else was blindly following? So I started to try to look into the character of what actually life is all about. I already had some very basic fundamental information. As I told you, the body, the cells are made out of proteins. 100,000 different kinds of proteins. The proteins are the building blocks that give us our physical structure and give us our behavioral attributes. What's interesting about the proteins is that proteins are linear molecules like threads. And that when the molecule is synthesized, the protein folds up into complex shapes. The final folding shape of a protein is actually a reflection of the balancing of the positive and negative charges along the length of this filament called a protein macromolecule. And so that the protein would fold itself up in such a way as to balance all of the charges and provide a very stable shape. And these shapes were the shapes that gave rise to the structures of the cell, so that they were indeed like physical building blocks, just like bricks building a building. However, as I mentioned, proteins are the unique molecules because proteins can change shape. And when a protein changes shape, the shape change actually reflects movement. The movement created by a protein, as it's changing from shape A to shape B, or in actual biochemical terms, as it changes from conformation A to conformation B, the movement that results is actually harnessed by the cell to carry out functions. So the building blocks start to move, and the movement is used to create the characters of physiology. Protein movements provide for digestion. Protein movements provide for respiration. Protein movements provide for muscle contraction. So all of a sudden we start to see how the static building blocks become dynamic and in their dynamic character create the character of life. It's interesting just to reflect on this very simple fact. A human cadaver looks exactly like a human because it still has all the proteins. It has the structural, physical configuration of a protein machine shaped like a human. But it doesn't express life. And then I'd have to say, so what is life? What is different between the cadaver and a living thing? And the answer is movement. And then all of a sudden we say, yeah, but movement comes from the proteins changing shape. So if you really want to understand the nature of life, then you'd have to ask the question is, what is it? that causes a protein to move or change shape. Because if you would understand what that is, then you can start to regulate or control the movement of proteins. Well, it was interesting because in my understanding through biochemistry courses and protein chemistry courses, I was informed already that, I, that what causes a protein to change shape is called a signal. A signal can be a particle, and now that we know that quantum mechanics is the foundation of the universe, we also recognize that particles are actually energy and that even pure energy waves could be signals. So biology has to recognize that signals, either in the form of physical things such as 
drugs or hormones or growth factors can influence proteins, so can signals that are not physical, etheric signals, such as radio waves and light waves and sound waves. All of these forms of energy are also signals. But how does a signal cause a protein to move? And the answer is this. The shape of a protein is finally realized when all the positive and negative charges in the protein are balanced as the protein folds in such a way to neutralize all of its charges. However, when a protein folds up, it actually looks like a little wire sculpture. Imagine that first you start with a long, straight strip of wire, but by folding it and kinking it and looping it, you can actually create a three-dimensional structure. Well, proteins are the equivalent of wire structure, the wire being the long protein backbone. But the wire will fold itself into particular shapes based on how it can balance its positive and negative charges. When doing so, we get a three-dimensional protein, a wire sculpture, so to speak. These sculptured proteins frequently have little pockets or clefts or little parts on their surface that can plug into things in our world, other chemicals, other atoms, other elements, so that, imagine this, the protein could act like a baseball glove. It can be shaped just like a baseball glove, and in the pocket, a ball can fit in. The ball would be tantamount to a signal. So imagine that we have a protein that folds itself up into the shape of a baseball glove, and that's the protein. And I say, well, what's the signal that can influence it? And the answer is, what chemical will have the precise shape of the baseball and the charge distribution that will allow that baseball to plug into the, to the pocket in that glove? So I look at the protein as the baseball glove and the signal as the baseball. And in this particular case, the signal has a charge to it. So while the baseball glove is the confirmation that is stable for that particular protein, as soon as the baseball enters the glove, the charges are altered because the baseball is bringing its own charges with it. In the face of the new charges, the protein wire, the backbone of the protein, the peptide, changes its shape to accommodate the new charges and then looks for a second shape that now is more stable when the baseball is present. So essentially what it says is this. The baseball glove, the protein, has a confirmation A. But when the baseball fits into the pocket of the glove, it causes the charges to change, and the protein rewraps itself into a different shape. Now we call that confirmation B. But the critical part about this is, is the movement that occurs as the protein is changing from shape A to shape B. Because if you can use that movement to drive work, then you can create functions. So, for example, let's consider the baseball glove protein to be a digestive enzyme and the baseball to be a particle of food. As the baseball enters into the glove, it causes the protein to change shape. As the protein changes shape, it breaks the baseball, and then you express digestion. And so, basically, the shape changes of a protein can be used to do something like break the baseball down into building blocks, and that would be a digestion process. The other possibility is that I can put a bunch of pieces in the glove, and then it changes shape and squeezes the pieces together and actually creates something. So, digestion and synthesis actually represent the same kind of process, but going in opposite directions. And yet, what we're really looking at is digestion is an active process. How did it occur? the movement of the glove. Yeah, but the glove is protein. Why did the protein move? And the answer is because the food molecule acted as a signal that forced the protein to change its backbone, and then that changing process, the action is converted into the process of digestion. As a result of that, we start to recognize, yes, there's an action involved with proteins. It's the action that animates life. And when you look at the human body with over 100,000 different proteins, all these different actions of each different protein collectively integrated into a giant machine represents what the human body is all about. That the proteins of our body are programmed by the nature of the genes that we have. But here's an interesting point. Well, the gene acts as a blueprint and I can build a protein using the blueprint of the gene, the protein doesn't express any life. And the gene doesn't cause it to have a life. The gene only provides a blueprint to make the protein. The life that we observed, the movement of the protein, wasn't controlled by the protein. It was influenced by the signal.
And all of a sudden you say, well, wait, wait, what does this really represent? It says, well, there's two parts to life, the physical part that makes us and the signal parts that control the movements from which we get our life characters, our physiology, able to express the characters of a living organism. So all of a sudden I say, oh, genes actually didn't control life in this sense, did they? Genes made the protein, but it was the signal in the protein interaction that produced the characteristic experiences of life. Why has this become relevant in our understanding? It says this, well, in looking at biology and behavior, I can only invoke two elements actually involved with the expression of behavior, the physical proteins and the signals that activate those proteins. But then all of a sudden you'd have to say to yourself, well, wait, if I look at my life and I say that something isn't working, then I'm really suggesting that there's some kind of defect in the behavior. And I say, well, wait, what causes behavior? Because if I understood what causes behavior, then I could probably identify what is responsible for the defect in that behavior that expresses itself as a disease. Well, we go back and I say, well, wait, there are only two components, the proteins that make the structure and the signals that cause the protein to change shape, engage in the function. Well, then I could absolutely come down to a simplistic conclusion is what is responsible for the alterations of behavior or the state of a dis-ease? What, what can I attribute that to? And there's only two things, proteins or signals. Well, then we go back and say, well, how much of our dis-ease states might be related to the protein and how much might be related to the signal? And it turns out very simply this. Less than 5% of the population can actually claim that their life is impacted by not having appropriate proteins. The reason why I come to that particular number is simply this. The proteins are shaped by the genes. It says the genes are the blueprints of proteins. It is now established that less than 5%, probably closer to 2% of the population arrived on this planet with alterations of the DNA called mutations, or in this case, birth defects, that lead to the production of a protein that doesn't work properly. So all of a sudden I look at the population and I say, if this individual is having a problem with expressing their biology, their physiology, and they're expressing it in the form of a, a disease, let's say, I say, what possibility is it that proteins are responsible for the observed disease? The answer is less than 5%, maybe even closer to 2%. Because if that person was the recipient of an altered gene, that person is expressing what is called a birth defect. And that really means that some of the protein parts that are used in the machinery weren't designed appropriately to work in that machine. And the defect in the part will manifest itself as a defect in the function. But wait less than 5%, maybe 2% of the population can legitimately claim that their biology is impacted by defective proteins. But then that leaves us with 95 to 98% of the population that when they get sick, when they have a dis-ease, what can we attribute the problem to in their case? Well, obviously not to the proteins because these are the people that got here with an intact genome and an ability to create all the normal proteins. So if it's not the proteins that are causing the defect, there's only one other component to the action. It's the signal. So the signals can be a major influence on the nature of our expression of our lives. And then I have to say, well, okay, if I'm expressing a disease and I have all the right proteins and my signal is messed up, how? can a signal be messed up? Because if I understand that, then I have insight into what I can do to change from a disease state back into a normal state. Okay? Enlisting this, it becomes simple again. Because there are only three ways that a signal can be distorted that would cause a dysfunction in the protein mechanism. The first way a signal can be distorted is through trauma. Meaning, Let's say you're walking down the street and you fall down and you wrench your back. And in wrenching your back, you actually cause uh, constrictions or interfere with the flow of information in the nerves, which are coordinating the functions of the human body, because the nervous system is carrying signals to the body. If I physically damage the nervous system, then that trauma physically interferes with the signal, and an interference with the signal leads by its nature to a dysfunction of the proteins. Because an inappropriate signal 
the function is, of the protein is also going to be inappropriate as well. So one of the first causes of a dis-ease other than the proteins is trauma that interferes with the signals. A secondary cause for dysfunction or disease is an interference of the passage of the signals because of the chemistry. Meaning this, the cells are made out of molecules and the molecules are involved with conveying the information from the central nervous system to the body cells in the periphery. If I put inappropriate chemicals into my biology, these inappropriate chemicals, which we could collectively call toxins, can interfere with the propagation and transmission of a signal. So if I put poisons between the source of the signal and the cells that are to receive the signals, these poisons can again distort the message and the signal. And therefore, poisons can interfere with the function of the proteins. And therefore, poisons and toxins can result in a dysfunction or a disease. It's a very obvious physical impediment to the interaction between a signal and a protein. The third source of signal uh, difficulties actually are very interesting because in the third source, there's actually nothing wrong with the signal. What happens in the third source is that we send the wrong signal at an inappropriate time, meaning that we are controlling our biology but actually miscontrolling it by inappropriately activating behaviors when they shouldn't be activated. The source of the problem in this case is actually the mind, in the sense that thoughts are sending inappropriate signals controlling our biology that are not in harmony with the world that we live in. And so when we start to run our biology with inappropriate signals, we actually begin to destroy ourselves. And the best example of that is, let's take the case of an anorexic. An anorexic looks into a mirror and perceives of themselves, and this is their mind making a thought of what they see. While everyone else looks at this person and sees that they're skinny as a rail and near death, the anorexic has a different thought. When they look in the mirror, they see themselves as overweight, fat. And so the thought of this anorexic person is going to be sent to the body to say, you're too fat, reduce, lose weight. And unfortunately, the thought was inappropriate. It's really based on a misperception. And the significance about that is that thought can actually cause the death of that individual. And there was nothing wrong with their biology. It was just that their thought was off. So again, this reveals how a signal distortion, not because it was physically distorted or distorted by trauma, but distorted by operation, by learning, by perception, can have as big an impact on the biology as anything physical has on the biology. And it can count for almost all the diseases that we actually now, express. The question is, how do these signals actually control and engage the proteins. We recognize there are two parts. Yes, a signal and a protein. The protein are the components inside the cells that carry out the functions of the cell. The signals by their nature come from the environment. Well, the interesting thing about this is, is that the proteins are in the inside of the cell and the signals that drive these proteins are actually derived from the external environment. So the issue is, how are the signals picked up by the proteins because inside a cell they're encased within a cell membrane and buried within the cytoplasm. The question is how can an environmental signal get from the outside and get to the inside to control the functions of the proteins? Well this is where my work came to a very exciting point way back in the early 80s. I started to recognize my goodness the membrane, the skin of the cell, is an interface between the external world where the environmental signals are derived and the internal world where the proteins lie. And that for the proteins to be activated, the signal has to cross through this membrane. So I started to take my attention and apply it to the understanding of the structure and function of this membrane. To just give you a little insight into the character of the membrane, the skin of the cell, let me give you this point. The skin is so thin that we can't see it in a regular microscope. And in fact, until the 1940s, biologists were not even sure that cells were even surrounded by a skin. Many scientists actually thought cells were like little jello moldings with fruit compote in the inside of it where the fruit were the organelles and the organelles were suspended in a gelatinous matrix. 
Yet others believe there was indeed some kind of membrane surrounding the outside that would contain the cytoplasmic components. It was not to the development of electron microscopy that we were able to actually resolve the structure of the membrane because it's so thin it's below the limits of resolution of the light microscope. You just can't see it. But once electron microscopy started to observe membranes, they found them everywhere. That every cell from every organism, from the most primitive organism on the planet, such as bacteria, to humans, all cells have cell membranes. And another interesting fact, all cell membranes appear to the same in regard to their structure. And that was a real interesting recognition because while many organisms have different kinds of components in their cytoplasm, some expressing, let's say, chloroplasts such as plant cells and animal cells not expressing those, animal cells having hemoglobin and that's not present in plant cells, that all different species had different kinds of components. However, there was one uniform character. Every living system had a surrounding controlling membrane, a membrane that enclosed the cytoplasm. This membrane acted as an interface between the external world and the internal world of the cell where the proteins reside. The other interesting thing about the membrane that it was found it can be comprised of two basic components. One component are little molecules called phospholipids. As the name says, lipids mean that they have an oil characteristic to them. The actual molecule actually has a water-loving and oil-loving component in the same molecule in the sense that molecules normally that dissolve in water are water-loving molecules and molecules that dissolve in oil are oil-loving molecules and oil and water don't mix. Now I'm talking about a molecule that is comprised of both oil and water. And so in a sense, it doesn't know whether to dissolve in water or to dissolve in oil. However, when thrown into water, these phospholipid molecules will spontaneously self-assemble into a layered structure. They actually will automatically form a membrane as the lipids try to respond to the water. They create a layered structure in which the membrane lipids, the lipids uh, component of the molecules are found in the center of the layer and the phosphate heads of the molecules which love water are found on either side of the layer. So the membrane has a three-layered structure. In the electron microscope, when you see it stained, it's black and white. There's a black layer, a white layer, and a black layer. In a sense, it, it almost looks like an Oreo cookie in the electron microscope. And it turns out that the icing inside the cookie is the equivalent of the lipids. Since oil and water don't meet and match with each other, since they separate from each other, then this membrane creates an interesting barrier or skin which has a complete lipid hydrophobic water-hating center that surrounds the cell. So the cell is actually encapsulated in a barrier that contains a hydrophobic zone. But this becomes very important because now this membrane acts as a skin. It keeps the components from the outside world from readily entering inside the cell and it keeps the components from the inside world from readily escaping from the cell. And that is because the little hydrophobic layer in the center of this three-layered membrane is a, a barrier that prevents anything that's soluble in water from going from one side to the other side. So the membrane is an impermeable skin. However, a membrane just made out of phospholipids would not really support life. Because if a cell had a skin that wouldn't let anything in and wouldn't let anything out, the cell would not survive for the simple reason is how would it get nutrients to activate its biology? How would it get rid of waste products that were the result of metabolism? Since the membrane is an impermeable barrier, then these functions would not be able to occur. This is why the membrane has a second component. It has proteins. Proteins, again, those complex molecules, reside in this three-layered structure. The proteins are so large that most proteins actually extend from both sides of the cell. So when you look at a cell membrane, you actually see some parts of proteins extending to the outer side of the cell membrane, and the same protein actually, because of its size, extends to the inside. The proteins span the membrane, and as a result, the proteins provide for a conduit to allow things from the outside to use the proteins as a conduit to get to the inside. So the proteins act as a device to communicate between the inside and the outside of the cell. Now remember, we talk about proteins as these structures that can change shape. Well, as these proteins are built into the membrane, I could also tell you this. There are two 
primary classes of proteins built into this membrane. The two classes of proteins represent one form is called receptors. The other form of proteins are called effectors. Because these proteins are not resting on the membrane, they're actually directly incorporated into the laminar structure, the layered structure of the membrane, we refer to these proteins as integral membrane proteins, which is abbreviated as IMPs. There are two classes of these IMPs, as mentioned, receptors and effectors. And here's how they work. The class of proteins called receptors are tuned to signals that are found in the environment. So a sense, like we mentioned before, a protein could be the shape of a baseball glove that would catch a signal that was the precise shape of a baseball. Well, consider that a protein in the cell membrane has the shape of a baseball glove. And if there's baseballs in the environment, the baseball will plug into the glove. But, as I also mentioned in that story of a signal binding to a protein, when the baseball plugs into the glove, it changes the charge of the protein, and the protein changes shape. So, this baseball glove, which is extending from the surface of the membrane and catching a baseball, also extends through the membrane. And so, when the baseball is received, the signal from the environment is identified and binds to the baseball glove, the protein changes shape. And inside the cell, you can see that protein changing shape because the protein of the baseball glove actually moves. And when the protein moves, it means that the glove has caught onto the signal. So if I'm inside the cell, I can tell you if a baseball is outside the cell by watching the receptor protein that has the shape of the baseball glove. Because when the signal, the baseball shows up, the glove will change shape. Well, now we have an understanding of how a single receptor protein might work. Let me inform you of this. There are thousands and thousands of different kinds of protein receptors built into the membrane. The receptor's function is to read the signals of the environment. Different kinds of receptors read different kinds of signals. Some receptors read calcium. Some receptors identify glucose. Some receptors specifically match with estrogen. Other receptors specifically complement adrenaline. Some see histamine. Basically, Whatever the cell can see in the environment, the reason it can see it's there is because there's a receptor that will complement with that signal. And when that signal shows up, that receptor will change its shape. And that will signal the fact that the actual signal is in the environment. So the changing of shape of a protein is a physical reflection of the presence of a signal. Well, this is very interesting, and it might seem a little bit obtuse. What, what is this membrane skin receptor business? Well, let me give you some interesting fact that we'll expand on in a little bit, and that is this. When I was teaching this cell biology and teaching about the proteins in medical school, in the opening day of teaching the course in cell biology, what I would inform the students of is a very important fact that most people weren't aware of. And that important fact is this. While you see yourself as a singular entity, the truth is you are not a single entity, that you are made out of living cells. It's the cells that are the living units that collectively make you. So you are actually a community of upwards up to 50 trillion cells. Secondarily, when you look at all the attributes that a human expresses, all the different kinds of physiological mechanisms and characters that humans express in their normal behavior and their normal lives, here's an interesting fact. There is not one new function present in the human that's not already present in every single cell. Wherever you have a function and an organ to carry out that function, this little tiny miniature cell has an organelle, meaning miniature organ, that carries out the same function. So the idea is, if you really want to study the cells, you can look at a human and get parallel understanding because they're built in the same image. In fact, the human is made in the image of the cell. And this is why science can study cells and apply that information directly back to humans, because we share the same functions, we share the same structures, and that whatever we can do as a human can only be done because our cells are doing it in the first place. So with that parallel that I said we can look at a cell and look at a human and compare the two and make an understanding from it, let's go back to that cell. And I was talking about on the skin of the cell, the skin reads the environment because on the skin are receptors. And then I say, well, wait, you're made in the image of that cell. Guess what? You have a skin. 
it reads the environment. And you have receptors built into that skin. There's some very big receptors that are very obvious. Eyes, ears, nose, taste bud. These are obvious receptor structures that are built into our skin. And their function is to what? Read the environment and then send a signal internally so we can interpret and respond to the environment that we live in. The parallel is exactly the same. The surface of the cell is a skin. It has receptors built into it. The receptors read the environment, and the information of the environment is relayed to the inside of the cell so the cell can know what's going on. So now we've covered the first part of the membrane's function, reading environmental signals. Again, so does your skin. Not only do we have the receptors in the head, the very large ones like ears, eyes, nose that we talked about, but all over your entire body, the skin is filled with receptors to let you know what the temperature is, to let you know if something is touching you, to give you all information about the environment, let you know about painful things. All these are receptors, actions that are built into the membrane called the human skin. The same thing occurs, but at a smaller level in the cell. So now we have one set of proteins that we described. These proteins are the receptors. They read the environment and change their shape when the signal shows up. But that only tells the cell that a signal is there and identifies what signal it is because the protein that responds will determine what signal was present in the environment. But now, how does the cell respond to the presence of the signal? How does it engage in a behavior? And the answer is, the other set of proteins that are built into the membrane, the other IMPs called effectors, as the name implies, effector proteins create an effect. And so when these proteins are built into the membrane, they have, like all proteins, a resting conformation. But the effector proteins are coupled to respond to activated receptors. So in the surface of the cell, there are couplings of receptor and effector proteins. When the receptor is not activated, the receptor and the effector protein don't actually communicate with each other because the shapes or conformations of the proteins in their inactive state do not provide for coupling. But when the protein receptor reads a signal, remember it changes its shape. So in a sense, the activated receptor has a different shape or conformation than the inactive receptor. The new activated shape it takes on turns out to be a physical complement that will plug into the effector protein, which was just resting there. So basically, let's review this. There are sets of proteins in the membrane that consist of receptors and effectors. The receptors read environmental signals. Before the signal shows up, the effector is in conformation A. The receptor is in conformation A. Neither of them plug into each other. However, if the receptor sees its signal, the consequence of a signal binding to a protein changes the conformation. So receptor A changes its shape into conformation B. Yes, but B is a structure that is recognized by the effector, so the receptor now plugs into the effector. But once the receptor binds to the effector, it changes the shape of the effector because the receptor acts as a signal and changes the effector from confirmation A to confirmation B itself. But here's the important part. When the effector changes its shape, the response is it leads to an activation of a cellular function, such as respiration or digestion or movement of the cell. So basically, we stand back and we look at the surface of the cell, and it's filled with all kinds of proteins built into that membrane. And there we can see one pair of proteins, a receptor and an effector. And they're not connected because there's no signal present. And now we'll play through the system. A signal shows up in the environment that the receptor can recognize. The system leads to the receptor binding the signal. When the signal is bound, the receptor changes its shape. In the new conformation, the receptor then plugs into the effector, it couldn't do so before because confirmation A wasn't recognized by the effector, but the activated form of the receptor is. So the activated receptor plugs into the effector, which in turn activates the effector to change shape, which in turn sends a signal into the cell to engage one of the functions. The function that engage is not a random function. 
the function that is engaged is directly related to whatever the signal is that showed up, so that the biology responds to the signal. To give you a personal example of what I'm talking about, consider this, that you walk out of your house and it's a very cold day. Your skin is your membrane. It's got receptors in it. You have receptors that read the temperature. When the receptor recognizes that it's cold out, it changes its conformation, sends a signal inside the cell, and that signal is mediated by an effector that responds to the sensory receptor. And that effector causes us to raise our metabolism and as a result generate more heat and keep our body at a constant 98.6. And basically, how did that work? A receptor at the skin picks up an environmental signal, engages an effector, which then adjusts the metabolism. So basically, the skin of the cell, the skin of the human are operating under the same mechanisms. Well, at one sense, somebody out there in the audience might be saying, now, wait a minute. You said that humans and cells are sort of physical images of each other. In fact, that is true. Then I also said that the organs of the human are reflected in the organelles of the cell. And lastly, I said that the cell membrane, the organelle that surrounds the cell, is the equivalent of the brain. And then I said the cell membrane is the equivalent of your skin. That's where some of you might go, wait a minute. Are you saying my skin is my brain? Yes, in fact, I am. But this is obvious information if you understand embryology. And just to connect these to show the relationship between cells and human bodies, let me just briefly review the early stages of embryology. In the formation of an embryo, a sperm and egg come together, and the fertilized cell is called a zygote. The fertilized cell begins to divide and form a ball of cells. The first form of the embryo is this loose aggregation, a ball of cells called the blastula. But the next phase of development of the embryo involves a sorting out of the cells to form three concentric layers like a bullseye target. The layers in Latin are called derms. Derms mean skin. That's why we talk about dermis and epidermis. So there are derms. There are three derms or layers of the embryo. The three layers from the outside in are called ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. Ecto means outer, derm means layer, ectoderm, outer layer, meso means middle, mesoderm is middle layer, and endo means inner, and endoderm therefore means inner layer, the three concentric layers. What's unique about the layering of the embryo at this stage is that these specific layers give rise to very, very specific organs and tissues. And here comes the catch that's really fun. The outer layer of the embryo, called the ectoderm, only gives rise to two structures in the developed human. The ectoderm provides for the skin, and the ectoderm provides for the central nervous system. So the parallels of comparing the skin of the cell to the brain is the exact parallel of looking at the human embryo and its three-layered configuration, recognizing that the ectoderm provides for both the skin and the brain at the same time because they are connected to each other. So in this case, we go back to the cell and say, okay, how does the cell control its behavior? And the answer is there are IMPs built into the membrane of two classes, receptors and effectors. That receptor effectors form combinations where the receptor is responsible for identifying an environmental signal and the effector is responsible for recognizing that the signal is present and then sending a signal into the cell to engage a protein mechanism that will make the appropriate behavior in response to that environmental signal. These proteins constitute switches. And how do they represent a switch? Well, look at it this way. The signal would directly derive the protein, but the protein is inside the cell, and the signal cannot get to the protein unless it crosses through the membrane. So the membrane acts as a barrier, but with these switches can allow specific signals to be recognized and the information sent through the membrane to engage the proteins on the inside. So when looking at the cell membrane, you're actually looking at the basic mechanism by which the brain operates, be it the brain of the cell or the brain of the human. It's exactly the same because of the relationship between cells and the structure of the human.
Well, these are the switches then. And on the surface of the cell, there's not just a single switch. On the surface of the cell, there are 100,000 different switches. The switch is responding to everything that's in that cellular environment. So that the surface of the cell is a very complex structure. Not that any particular switch is complex. It's complex in regard to the numbers of switches that are simultaneously operating in a living cell. While I can easily sit here and describe the action of one signal affecting one switch, which in turn affects one behavior, human complexity comes in the regard of handling a 100,000 switches and the consequences of where each switch is being on or off at any particular time. Yet, the fundamental nature of any switch and the mechanism it controls is very, very simple. So it's really interesting because in our effort to study human behavior and study the human brain, we're completely at a loss. A hundred years of neuroscience and we really don't know how the brain works. The problem is the complexity of dealing with a structure that has a trillion cells. How can you really try to figure out the interactions among a trillion cells? This is why studying a single cell is very important because by observing a single cell, I can see the mechanisms down at its lowest level of complexity. And when you start to see the basic nature of how a single cell works, you can take this work and apply it to the human. So we have at the surface of our cells switches. Now, when I first started talking about the switches to people that would attend lectures, I called them what they were. I called them IMP switches comprised of receptors and effectors. And I could see, obviously, that really tickled everybody's fancy because as I provided the name of that, that switch in scientific terms, everybody just looked at me with staring eyes going, what's he talking about? It's one of those complex scientific terminology things again. And I realized that really wasn't an adequate way to describe the switch. So I started to look at describing a switch by defining its function. And the definition of the switch is easily derived by defining the function of the receptor and defining the function of the effector. The receptor, the function is very obvious. If you're familiar with it yourself. It's awareness of the environment. That's what your receptors provide. Your eyes, your ears, your nose. These are providing information to you about what's going on in the environment. The protein receptors on the cell membrane provide to the cell information as to what's going on in the environment. So it provides awareness of the environment. The effector does something different, though. The effector sends a physical signal into the cell to engage any of the physiological mechanisms that would be appropriate in response to that signal. So the function of the effector is to provide a physical sensation. So when I defined the structure of the membrane in trying to provide the audience with what it really represents, I defined the membrane switch we've been talking about as an awareness of the elements of the environment through a physical sensation. What was totally interesting was this is the exact same definition used for a particular word that was already in the dictionary that most everybody was familiar with. The word is perception. This is the exact definition of perception, an awareness of the elements of the environment through a physical sensation. And all of a sudden, I call the switch perception. And all of a sudden, everybody in the audience started to understand right away what I was talking about. Perception controls behavior. The switch, the awareness of the elements of the environment, then engaging the effector, which sends a physical sensation, connects an environmental signal to a biological behavior. The switch is called perception. And therefore, when I told the audience, perception controls behavior, everyone immediately understood what I said. And what was really interesting is by the time we really get to this part of the discussion, and we're talking about behavior being controlled, you might realize something. We haven't even talked about DNA. The issue is, life isn't controlled by DNA. DNA is a blueprint to make the proteins. But the proteins aren't controlled by the DNA. The proteins are controlled by the signals of the environment, which are mediated by the perception. So the first real hard conclusion in the nature of life in the study that we've been talking about right now is perception controls behavior, which simply implies an environmental signal is picked up by a switch called perception, which then directs a signal to a protein mechanism inside the cell that creates a biological function that will respond to the signal in the environment. So all of a sudden it's like, wow, 
Life isn't controlled by genes. No, it's controlled by the signals in the environment. And this is very interesting because I observe this in my cultures of uh, stem cells, that in creating the culture of stem cells, one of the first things you do is digest the tissue to free up the cells. But in the digestion process using enzymes, the enzymes clip off the receptor proteins. And so as I'm preparing my cell cultures, one of the first things that happens is the receptor proteins are lost from the surface of the cell. The cell can't read the environment, for at that moment the receptors are defective. Interesting point. When the cell cannot respond to the environment, it remains as a little round ball. It doesn't express any behavior whatsoever. That the cell does not express behavior until such time that the metabolism occurring inside the cell leads to the replacement of the receptors that were lost by the enzymes. Once the receptors start to appear back on the surface of the cell, the cell then engages in behavior. So in a very interesting point, when the cell cannot respond to the environmental signals, the cell does not express behavior. The signals and behavior are tightly integrated upon one another. So now we've gotten to the point. Behavior, yes, controlled by the environmental signal. And behavior is created through the action of the proteins in the cytoplasm. But then here comes an interesting point. As I said, there are over 100,000 different proteins. A cell does not make all of the proteins all of the time. It makes the proteins that it needs to use. Well, consider this possibility that a cell is in the environment and a signal shows up that wasn't there before and the cell has to make a response but now it doesn't have the proteins in the cytoplasm to make that response and yet the signal is at the door knocking on the perception switch saying okay I'm out here and the cell has to make a response now the question is what does the cell do when it doesn't have the protein aha this is where we bring in the genes, because the genes are the blueprints to make the proteins. But the question is this, how does a gene know when it should offer its blueprint to make a protein? The genes don't see the world. The genes are encapsulated and closed within the nucleus and have no visibility or awareness of what's really going on in the world. In that regard, genes don't know what should be activated and which proteins should be made and which ones should not be made themselves. That the genes are not self-actualizing. And this is very interesting because if we talk to conventional biologists or read the current literature, we always hear phrases such as a gene turned on, a gene turned off, giving us the impression that genes are intelligent units, that genes have the ability to respond to the world that they live in by observing that world and making responses through an intelligence, something like a self-actualization. The interesting part is, these are all words based on the original belief from the central dogma that genes control life, that genes are the active component. That was perceived in the dogma. And ever since then, we bought into the concept of genetic determinism. Genes are controlling life. Every time we invoke the concept that a gene expresses control, we're suggesting that the gene is able to self-actualize, that it has a consciousness or an intelligence to do it to allow it to turn on or turn off. Well, this, as I said, is what we bought from our belief that genes were actually in control. But the reality is, genes are not in control. We have already demonstrated that by the fact that we could remove the genes from a cell and the behavior is still there. But now we can understand why that occurred. Because the proteins are in the cell, and the proteins are controlled by the perception switches, and therefore the genes weren't even necessary. And that's why enucleating the cell didn't really cause a problem. However, the cells ultimately did die when the nucleus was gone. And the question is, well, then what was the role of that nucleus? And the answer is simply this. The genes provide the blueprints to make the proteins that comprise the machinery of the cell. That if I remove the nucleus, I remove the blueprints. The cell can still go along as long as it has the proteins. However, if a protein breaks down, which they normally do through wear and tear, just like any machine, when the proteins break down, I need to replace them. If there's no nucleus, then there are no blueprints. And so in a nucleated cell, when the proteins break down, there is no recourse to identify how to make a new protein. And when enough proteins break down that interfere with the vital functions of the cell, that's when the cell will begin to die if it doesn't have genes. So 
The cells die not because the nucleus was removed and interfered with the operation of the cell. The cells die when they're enucleated because at some point down the line, when I need to replace a protein that is vital for the function, I don't have the gene blueprint to do so. The cells without a nucleus can't reproduce their parts or themselves. So interesting point is, removing the nucleus prevents reproduction. And when you understand that, you realize, my goodness, in all the books we've given the nucleus the responsibility of being the brain. But in truth, the nucleus is just the gonad. The nucleus is the reproductive element. Now, if we look at the nucleus as a gonad and how it applies to reproduction, then we go back and have to say, let's look at those chromosomes, because the chromosomes contain the DNA where the blueprints are. Well, the interesting part, if you can recall from the earlier discussion, is that chromosomes are made out of 50% protein and 50% DNA. And in 1944, when Avery McLeod McCarty revealed that the DNA was the element that controlled the traits, protein biochemists lost out. Nobody cared about the proteins. Everybody wanted to deal with the DNA. So all subsequent experiments from the late 40s onwards really involved this, isolating the genetic material, the chromosomes, from the cell separating the components of the chromosomes, the proteins, from the DNA, saving the DNA to do the molecular genetic experiments, and throwing away the proteins. So for 50 years, we threw away the proteins, which constitute about 50% of the nucleus. At some point, people started to say, 50% of the chromosome is protein. That's a lot of filler material. Is the protein doing something? And people started to look at the proteins. And all of a sudden they found, oh my God, we didn't understand this because we've been throwing away the proteins for 50 years. There was a new understanding of the relationship between the proteins and the DNA. In the experiments that revealed that DNA was self-regulatory, those were experiments that were done with pure DNA. They in no way reflected what was actually going on inside a living cell where the DNA was already complex with the proteins. When we put the proteins back with the DNA, we get another understanding. It changes our belief in what we describe as genetic control and genetic determinism. It goes like this. Up to now, we've been talking as if they were controllable elements that genes turn on and turn off. And the truth is, a gene is simply a blueprint. That as a blueprint, it has no on and off. Just as much as an architect's blueprint doesn't have an on or off. The blueprint is not self-actualizing. If it were, the architect would only have to throw the blueprint at the building site, and the self-actualizing blueprint would build the building. And yet the reality is, no, a blueprint is just information. Now the question is, what activates the information? Well, in this case, the contractor who reads the blueprint and then decides to act upon the blueprint. Well, when we go back to the cells and the DNA and we say the DNA is the blueprint, but what reads it? What's the contractor that is involved with activating the expression of a gene? It turns out it was the protein that we threw away for 50 years. All of a sudden, there's a new insight in understanding the nature of the chromosomes. Chromosomes are actually DNA strands surrounded by a sleeve of protein. Basically, what this says is as follows. The blueprints to make the parts of the human body are encoded along the length of the DNA. Each blueprint is referred to as a gene. But the genes cannot be seen inside the cell because when the DNA is in the nucleus of the cell, the DNA is covered by a sleeve of protein. If you want to read that blueprint, you have to remove the protein first. This was not recognized before, especially in experiments where you throw away the protein and just study the DNA. When we go back to the living system, we realize that in order to, to get to the blueprint, you have to remove the protein sleeve. To control a gene, then, is actually not controlling the gene, but is controlling whether the sleeve is on or off. Yeah, but now you already have some insights as to how can I control the sleeve. And it goes back to this. Remember, the sleeve is protein. That protein can change its shape when it responds to environmental signals. So consider this. In the resting state, when we're not reading a gene, the protein sleeve is covering up the DNA. And the gene is not active. You can't read it. It's underneath the protein sleeve. 
But now we go back to that situation I described. A signal shows up in the environment, is read by the receptor of the cell, and the cell wants to engage a behavior, but uh-uh, can't do it. Why? The proteins aren't present in the cell. So what we need to do is we need to get the blueprint to make the protein. Well, here's how it works. The signal from the cell membrane then travels to the nucleus. And in the nucleus, the signal complements with the specific proteins that cover the gene that we want to use. So when the signal binds to the chromosomal proteins, it causes the sleeve to pop off. When the sleeve pops off, the blueprint's exposed. Then the cell makes a copy of the blueprint as it's exposed. The copy is called RNA. The RNA is the actual physical blueprint that leaves the nucleus of the cell and goes into the cytoplasm of the cell. In the cytoplasm of the cell, there are protein devices that will read the RNA blueprint and create the new protein. So basically, it says this, genes are neither on nor off. In truth, Genes are either covered or uncovered. But the cover and uncovering is the character of the protein. And therefore, if you want to use a gene, you actually have to regulate the protein sleeve. But the regulation of the protein sleeve is controlled by signals that are sent by the membrane from perception switches. So all of a sudden, we go from a biology where we looked at the genes as these devices that control their lives. People think that if they walk down the street someday, one of their genes is going to turn on them. And this gene is the culprit that this gene caused a cancer. When it turns out, no, that's not actually how it works. The gene can only be activated when it's in response to an environmental signal mediated by the switches in the membranes which are called perceptions. So when we look at this and put it all together, it says that the environmental signal via the perception switch sends a signal to the nucleus to uncover the gene to allow us to make a copy of the gene and then make proteins derived from that gene. What this basically says is genes control nothing. Genes are responsive to the signals of the environment. This new field of study is something called epigenetics. And in fact, this is what I was studying back in 1977, even though epigenetics is a term that is probably no older than 1995. Almost 20 years before the field of epigenetics was established, I was already seeing the action of epigenetics in my clone cultures. How was that? Yes, put my culture in condition A, environmental condition A, the environmental signals selected the genes to form muscle. Take the same cell and put it in environment B, and the environmental condition in that culture selected a completely different set of genes and caused the formation of bone. And thirdly, a completely different set of environmental signals leads to the activation of genes that provide for fat. The control of gene activity by environmental signals is the new science of epigenetic control. Well, most all of us and the students I was teaching in medical school are very familiar with a concept called genetic control, which literally means control by genes. The new understanding of epigenetic control is just barely making itself into the public domain at this time. It's still an identity of a mechanism that is understood at the leading edge of science. And even most scientists still don't understand the concept of epigenetics. Epigenetics is the mechanism by which we control genes. Now, the interesting aspect about epigenetics is epigenetics is mediated by environmental signals through perceptions. So rather than the old belief that everyone bought into that genes control life, and this is the big problem for the Human Genome Project, because when it was revealed there were only 25,000 genes, the reason why that was a failure to them was that it obviously takes more than 25,000 genes to make the complexity of a human. And so they didn't understand the control mechanism because they believed the genes were controlling themselves. And there obviously weren't enough genes. Now we find that epigenetics exists. Epigenetics is, in fact, the equivalent of a second genetic code. It's not secondary genetic code. It's actually a primary genetic code because epigenetics can change the readout of the genes. Well, we used to think one gene makes one protein. With studies on epigenetics, we find this. 
by the diversity of environmental signals, there's a diverse response that can be manifest from each gene. In fact, we now know this, and this is an outstanding fact, that through epigenetic mechanisms, a single gene can provide for over 2,000 different proteins because epigenetics is the reader of the blueprint. Epigenetic mechanisms can cut the blueprint into pieces and splice it together in a different configuration and get a completely different readout from the same blueprint. Epigenetics can only read part of a gene and ignore the rest of the gene blueprint, again changing the product. And all of a sudden, there's this new genetic code that starts to come into our understanding. A genetic code that is so powerful that it is a contractor that can read the genes and change the structure of the organism. Well, here's an interesting fact. The genes in a human are virtually identical to the genes in a chimpanzee, which are virtually identical to the genes in a rat. All of us have the same kind of building blocks. But if we all have the same genes for the same building blocks, why don't we look the same? And the answer is because how the organism is constructed is not based on the genes that make the building blocks. It's based on the epigenetic control that humans have a different epigenetic readout of the building blocks than a chimp. So we can use the same building blocks and somebody can create a chimp and using a different way of assembling the same building blocks, you can create a human and even further altering the assembly of the building blocks you can actually provide for a rat. And so it turns out that the control of life is not built into the genes that provide for the building blocks. The genes that we have studied from the beginning of the understanding of the genetic code to the very moment. That's where most research is involved. However, the field of epigenetics is changing our emphasis. We're now beginning to recognize that rather than messing with the genes, it's epigenetics that can alter the readout of the genes. Interesting to this point. Most of us are even missing genes, and yet we don't even know that we're missing the gene. The reason is because via epigenetic mechanism and a process called genetic capacitation, other genes can be modified by epigenetic mechanisms to provide products that would have been derived from the missing gene. So you would never even know that you were missing gene. Epigenetics is this global mechanism that covers the readout of our biology. And the fundamental understanding behind epigenetics is epigenetics is controlled by environmental signals. Why is this important? Because in our history to dominate and control nature, we thought the genes controlled life. And if I want to change the character of life, I have to change the genes, genetic engineering. And what we're beginning to find out is now, my goodness, wrong emphasis, wrong genome. We should be looking at epigenetics because epigenetics can alter the readout of any particular gene. But you can change epigenetics not by changing the genes, but by changing the perception to the environment. But wait, how did perception get in there? And then go back and realize the environmental signal that controls epigenetics is mediated by the switches on the cell surface called perception. And all of a sudden we start to see, yes, how you perceive the world now not only controls just the biological proteins that make the functions of respiration, digestion, movement, but how you see the world, your perception of the world, selects which genes are going to be activated and not only just selects the genes, but can modify the readout of the genes to make a protein that would best fit the environmental circumstances of the time. And then when you realize it, you say, oh my goodness, Think how much easier it is to change our lives, not through genetic engineering, the old way of messing with the protein-building genes, but by changing our perception, which then alters the readout of our genes. And in fact, when I talked about the influences that cause disease, and I mentioned trauma, toxins, and thought, thought becomes the big element in this regard. Since perception runs our genes, misperceptions can misrun our genes. And misperceptions are interpretations of the world that are inaccurate. And yet the reality of the biology, as I mentioned, is it responds to perceptions. So I could call this the biology of perception. And yet, why did I call it the biology of belief? And the answer is, because not all of our perceptions are true. Some of them are totally inaccurate. And yet, 
even if they're inaccurate, they still run our biology. And inaccurate perceptions will inaccurately run our biology, which would lead to dysfunctions and disease. And that is why thought becomes a prominent contributor to the state of health that we express. So it then recognize the role that perception is the primary mechanism that controls biology. When we start to look at how perceptions influence cells, I started to get some very fundamental nature of the degrees and types of perception by observing my cells. I found that I could actually subdivide perceptions into three categories uh, based on the responses of the cells that I would call things that I would put into the environment that the cells liked, that supported their growth, as positive growth-promoting perceptions. Meaning, if I put nutrients in a Petri dish, the cells would read that perception of the presence of the nutrients, and the cells would move toward the perception. So I found that any perception that causes the cell to move toward it represents a perception associated with growth because growth means to take in that thing, whatever it is, and assimilate it into your life. In contrast, if I put some things into the culture that actually threaten the life of the cells, such as toxins, they responded to the perception of the toxins with a completely different response. That when toxins were put in the Petri dish, the cells didn't move to the toxins, they moved in the complete opposite direction. And then I started to realize very simply this. If things were in the environment that threatened the survival of the organism, in response to that perception, the organism moves away from the stimulus. So growth stimuli cause the organism to move to it, be open in the process, and take in those stimuli to incorporate them in the growth of the organism. And those stimuli that required protection cause the organism to move in the complete opposite direction, away from the stimuli, and in the process close themselves down to protect them from the noxious environment that they found themselves in. So I had two fundamental responses or perceptions, those that promote growth and those that lead to behaviors that we would classify as protection behaviors. There is indeed a third response to perception, which is actually no response at all, meaning that some things in the environment are totally innocuous. They don't promote growth, but they don't kill you either. I usually refer to these innocuous things as elevator music. You get into the elevator, you don't actually dance, but it doesn't kill you. It's just background. So now I say organisms respond to their perceptions of the world, that they types of perceptions could be categorically divided into three different classifications. Those perceptions that provide growth, and these perceptions cause the organism to move toward the stimulus and take it in. Those perceptions that require protection responses, which cause the organism to move away from the stimulus and close themselves down. And then those perceptions which are just elevator music background, innocuous, and no response is required at all. So it's interesting, it says that there are basically two fundamental actions that can result from a perception, growth or protection. What I really observed that was very important in understanding the lessons the cells were trying to teach me was simply this, that cells could not be in growth and in protection at the same time. They were mutually exclusive behaviors in this regard. Growth, move to a stimulus, be open to assimilate it. Protection, completely opposite. Move away from a stimulus, close yourself down to protect yourself from the environment. What's interesting about it is the simple, obvious nature that a cell cannot move in both directions at the same time. Cells can be in growth where they're actually responding to their environment and building themselves up. Or cells can be closed to the environment in protection, walling themselves off, but you can't be open and closed at the same time. You can't move to a stimulus and away from a stimulus at the same time. So I started to recognize that, that living organisms were responding to the stimuli in regard to their behavior, and that could be described as either responding to it in growth or responding to it in protection. Well, it's interesting because when we bring this up to the level of human biology, here's an interesting fact. That growth and protection, the extremes of stimuli between growth and protection as perceived by the human, can be described as love and fear.
Love is the ultimate growth response for a human. Once you experience love in your field, if you perceive love, you will move to that love no matter where it is and try to get it and assimilate it and take it in. If love's on the other side of the mountain, you will climb over that mountain to get to love and take it in. If the mountain is too high, you'll dig a tunnel through the mountain to get to love. It is the ultimate growth perception, love for humans. In contrast, fear is the exact opposite. When you fear something, you try to get away from it. You try to close yourself off. You wall yourself off from fear. You get in a protection response. So that it's interesting, well, yes, many things can be supporting our growth, our nutrition, the environment that we live in, the physical house, and all these other kinds of things. It turns out that love seems to be the most profound of all of the perceptions for growth. It is interesting because in Eastern European countries, there are many, many orphanages because in those countries, people have children as promoted by the church, but then they recognize when they get past a certain number of children, they can actually maintain all the extra children are dropped off at the orphanages. Well, it's interesting because the orphanages provide interesting study sites. When you observe the kids in these orphanages, you observe something such as this. They all are fed very well. They all have clothing, they have their rooms, they're protected from the elements, they have everything except love. And the interesting part about that is, in the absence of love, every one of their vital statistics are suppressed by 30% or more. Their physiological correlates are greatly depressed, they're really very sickly in general. Many of them are autistic. Now, autism in this particular situation uh, is really derived from the fact that if they're not getting love, they're not being allowed to open themselves and expose themselves to the outside world. In the absence of love, they close themselves down. Autism in this particular situation is a result of closing themselves down, protecting themselves from the world that doesn't offer them that love. So it's very interesting that there is a correlation in the children of how they respond to love and how their physiology is a direct connection to their perceptual experiences. Well, it turns out why these perceptions that support us give us health and why our perceptions that where we buy into fear and threats of our survival actually cut down our life uh, is related to a mechanism in the human body called the H. P A axis. The H stands for hypothalamus. The P stands for pituitary. The A stands for adrenal glands. And they collectively interact in the following way. The H, the hypothalamus, is the portion of the brain that does the interpretation of the perceptions. So when you observe your world, your hypothalamus is designating whether this perception is one that promotes growth or this perception requires a protection response. When the hypothalamus perceives signals in the environment that require a protection response, it must engage the body's behavior to deal with the requirement of protection. So this is why the hypothalamus, upon interpreting a stress response, will send that information to the pituitary gland. Well, the reason why the pituitary gland is involved is very simple. As you may remember, even from elementary school, the pituitary gland is called the master gland. It is the gland that sends signals to 50 trillion cells to coordinate all their behaviors. So if I'm going to direct the operation of the machine, the pituitary gland becomes a conduit to get the information to all of the cells of the system. So the situation of a stressful existence interpreted by the hypothalamus is forward to the pituitary gland. But since the threat comes from the outside and I need to engage a protection response, this is why the signal is then forwarded to the adrenal gland, because even the adrenal gland, if you remember from high school classes, is the gland that's associated with fight or flight. The adrenal gland is the gland that engages the behaviors of protection. So when we see a stressful environment before us, we activate the HPA axis, which results in our getting into a protection response. Remember, protection is closing yourself down and walling yourself off from the noxious environment. In this part, what do the adrenal glands do to promote this behavior? And this becomes very important for the following reason. The adrenal glands send out stress hormones. Well, the stress hormones inform the system that the threat that we may experience is coming from the outside world. Since we're going to have to deal with the outside world, we really want to nourish our arms and legs because in a fight-or-flight 
behavior, those are the organs that we're going to use to maintain our existence. So in fight or flight, using arms and legs, I want to nourish those arms and legs and give them all the energy I possibly can to carry out their very important task of saving my life. So to do that, the body shifts the allocation of energy to the protection system. Well, in the textbooks of physiology, they say this in response to the fact that when stress hormones are released into the system, the blood is preferentially sent to the arms and legs. Well, that makes obvious sense. I want the blood, which carries nutrition, to go to the arms and legs so I can energize my muscles and allow me to use fight or flight behavior to protect myself. But when you go back to that sentence I just used, there's a very important part of the phrase. The phrase goes, the blood is preferentially sent to the arms and legs. That causes us to pause a second and say, so where was the blood before it was in the arms and legs? And that's when we realize the blood was in the viscera, the gut. But what's the function of the gut? The blood is nourishing the visceral elements to do what? Well, the function of the viscera is growth and maintenance of the body. All the organs of metabolism and digestion and energy distribution and filtering systems and all the things that keep us healthy and alive are really the elemental functions of the viscera. And yet, when I'm in a state of protection, I need to send all my nourishment to my arms and legs. And this is accomplished by the fact that when we see an environment that requires protection, we gauge the HPA axis, when the stress hormones are released into the body, the stress hormones cause the blood vessels in the viscera to constrict. When the blood vessels are constricted, the blood flow is restricted. No longer is blood flow easily going through the visceral elements. They stop their functions basically because without blood there's no nourishment. Then the processes of growth are inhibited. That growth mechanisms are actually shut off when we are in a stress response because we're allocating all the energy via the blood to the peripheral organs. Well, in saving energy, we also shut down some very, very vital, important systems as well. One of those is the immune system. The immune system and the adrenal system are both actually protection systems, but they protect us from different things. The adrenal system protects us from threats outside of our body. The immune system protects us from threats that enter into our body, threats such as virus or bacteria or parasites that would like to take over the operation of our system and feed off of us. These elements are inhibited or restricted through the action of the immune system. But if I recognize that my stresses are more important in the outside world than the stresses I perceive in the internal world, that's when I'm activating my HPA axis. That's when I'm releasing the adrenal stress hormones, and the stress hormones are encouraging protection from outside threats. Well, to allocate all the energy it can, the system will inhibit the action of the immune system. The body recognizes the immune system uses tremendous quantities of energy to carry out its protection functions. Yet if I'm running away from a saber-toothed tiger and I'm having a bacterial infection, my central nervous system, my intelligence system will easily recognize that perhaps we ought to put all the money into running away from the tiger. And if we survive, then we can actually go fund that immune system. Well, this is actually what happens, because when we activate the adrenal hormones, the stress hormones don't only cause the blood to go from the viscera to the periphery, the stress hormones also shut off the immune system. Interesting, this is a fact that has been known by the medical profession for a long time, and they actually use stress hormones very specifically for this function when they're busy transplanting organs and tissues into a recipient. Because the organs and tissues of the transplant are foreign tissues, the recipient's immune system would immediately set about to eliminate the foreign invasive transplanted cells, the tissues and organs that the doctor provided to the recipient. Well, if we don't want the immune system to reject the organs, then what you would really like to do is restrict or reduce or inhibit the immune system. This is exactly why recipients of grafted tissue receive stress hormones, because when they receive them, it inhibits the activity of their immune system and allows the graft to take and allows them to maintain the foreign tissue. Yes, but this is a very unique biological consideration and an experimental situation at that. What does it mean in regard to stress hormones in our everyday life and the presence of these stress hormones interfering with our immune system? And it goes like this, that all of us, 
are right now infected with almost all the viruses and bacteria and pathogens that affect humans. I could take a blood sample out of every one of you right now, no matter how healthy you feel, I will show you that you have organisms in your blood. Well, it's very interesting because biologists are very familiar with these organisms. In fact, they call them collectively opportunistic organisms, meaning this, you give them the opportunity and they'll take over. If you are in a state of good health and a state of growth, you are supporting the operation of the immune system, and the immune system will keep a lid on these invasive organisms. While it might not be able to kill all of the organisms, it certainly can restrict their growth and limit their proliferation. And this keeps a lid on those opportunistic organisms from really impacting us. However, once we start to get into a stressful environment, then what happens is the stress hormones from the adrenal glands start to inhibit the immune system. When the immune system operation is interfered with, these invasive organisms then get the opportunity to start proliferating and taking over. Which basically says this, most people when they're in a happy state of life are very, very healthy. But once they start to get stressed, they start to get sick. Some people say, well, I just caught something when I was stressed. But the truth is more likely you already had something, and now that you're stressed, you remove the cover of the immune system by inhibiting its action through stress hormones. So all of a sudden you start to realize the very debilitating character of stress, that stress shuts down our growth mechanisms. The longer we're under stress, the more we're inhibiting the action of the viscera. That stress shuts down the immune system because the more we're concerned of fears from the outside, the more we reduce the function of the internal protection mechanism just to allocate its energy to be used for the external threat. And well, if that's not bad enough, there's actually what I refer to as the insult to injury. There's a third character of the stress response mediated by the HPA axis. And that is the following. Think about it this way. If you are in a uh, fight or flight response, do you think you would rely on reflex behavior or conscious information processing to deal with the fight or flight response? The answer is obvious. Reflex behavior because it's absolutely faster and more powerful and able to control us rather than conscious thinking. Conscious thinking is a slow process. Well, you'd be sitting there as your car is going out of control in your middle of an action. If it was controlled by consciousness, you might hear yourself going, uh, whoa. Well, rather than relying on that intelligence to run the car, when you're in a stress response, the stress hormones cause the blood vessels in the forebrain, the conscious part of the brain, to constrict, just as the stress hormones causes the constriction of the blood vessels in the viscera. And just as when the visceral blood vessels are constricted, visceral function stops because it's not being nourished by blood, in a stressful situation, when we constrict the blood vessels in the forebrain, we inhibit conscious thinking. But in the process, the blood is then preferentially sent from the forebrain to the hindbrain, where we're really nourishing the reflex centers. So when we're in a stress response, we primarily operate from hindbrain reflex mechanisms and inhibit forebrain consciousness, which in the end simply says this, when we're in stress, we're less intelligent, because at that point, we're not using intelligence. We're just using reflexive behavior. So these are three very big detriments to our normal physiology. But this isn't a detriment of the way evolution designed the system because evolution designed the system only to use the stress response at certain periods and only for short periods of our lives to run away from that saber-toothed tiger, for example. Once you got away from that tiger, then you automatically go back into the growth mechanisms to nourish yourself and to maintain your life. If another tiger shows up, you run until you get away and then you go back into the growth mechanism again. So basically what the information really reveals is this. Under normal evolution, a stress response is usually a very restricted response only used for short periods of time. But if you look at the world that we live in today, you see we live in a world where stress is the key word. Everything is stressful. The jobs are stressful. The environment's stressful. The food's stressful. What we're beginning to realize is while evolution designed the stress system to be only used for short periods of time and short spurts and pulses, we are now operating from stress, most of us, 24-7, 365. This has caused a great debilitation of health of the individual and of the population. We see it throughout the entire population in regard to the crisis in health care of so many people being sick for so long. And the fact is, 
in our old perception, the perception that is actually conventional allopathic medicine today, we look at a sick body as a Newtonian physical mechanism whose chemistry is off and that we can fix a sick body by just throwing in drugs. However, the new biology based on perception and epigenetics reveals that it's not the machine that's wrong. It's the environment and our perception of the environment that is caustic. Interestingly, it takes us back to that very first day I did a cell culture and exactly what Irv Konigsberg warned me of. He said, if the cell isn't healthy, before you try to change the cell, look at the conditions of the environment. And this is exactly where we should be today, because as I said, we are cells incarnate. Even though we're comprised of 50 trillion cells, we actually represent a composite of 50 trillion cells living as one giant cell. And the significance is, when we get sick, while we have a tendency to say, well, let's fix your physical body, the reality of Irv's warning comes to play here and says, before you fix that physical body, first consider the nature of perceptions, because perceptions are the things that primarily distort the normal functioning and operation of the machine. And I refer back again to the fact that I said the operation of the biology is due to the signals and the proteins. And then remember, only a very small percentage of people can claim that any of their dysfunctions in life are due to the proteins, that then the vast majority of us have to recognize it's the signaling that is a responsible element, just as Irv said. It's the signaling from the environment, our perception from the environment, that controls the status of our health. Yet, while this is very interesting information, in the end it is most empowering. Because again, it says, if you really want to control your biology interior health as well as your exterior reality, you have to recognize the power of your perceptions in shaping both your physiology and your life regard. experiences. Then it's really incumbent upon us to understand the nature of our perceptions. Where do we get the perceptions that run our biology? It's not so much the positive working perceptions that I'm really concerned about. What I'm really trying to bring our attention to are our misperceptions. And the reason for that is simply obvious. If we are misperceiving the environment, then by the nature of that definition, we are misrunning the nature of our biology. Meaning, if the wrong information is getting to the cells, the cells are engaging behavior that is inappropriate. And it turns out this is the primary cause of the problems of humans on this planet. It is not their physiology. It is their perceptual vision of the planet that we live on. So in understanding the source of perception, let's consider three different sources that collectively contribute to the perceptions that run our lives. The three sources are as follows. One is instincts perceptional responses that we don't actually have to learn. Instincts are provided with the genetics of the machinery. We're born with instincts. Instincts are behaviors that are simple stimulus response mechanisms that require no thinking. So, for example, if I take a rubber mallet and hit your knee, your leg will kick. It had nothing to do with processing any information. It was simple reflex. The stimulus of the mallet engages the muscle of the leg without even bringing the brain into it. Instincts are essentially no-brainers. They can be carried out without any thoughts at all. If a child puts its hand into a fire, it will immediately pull its hand back out of the fire by instinct. Why? Because the muscles that will yank the hand out are directly connected to the pain receptors in the skin. It doesn't require conscious processing. So instincts are provided to humans through the genetics that we acquire at birth. And there's a large variety of instincts. Some of them are simple things, such as the reflex of hitting your knee and kicking your leg. But other instincts are very, very complex. For example, all mammals are born with the ability or instinct to know how to swim, a very complex behavior involving the swimming muscles and the breathing apparatus and the coordination thereof. That a baby can come out of the birth canal underwater and instantaneously swim like a porpoise or a dolphin, come up to the top of the water and take its first breath naturally by exposing its face to the air, then turning around and going back into the water again. All of this is an elaborate, extensive behavioral program that is provided by instincts. However, the vast majority of perceptions that run our lives did not come from instincts. They were acquired from our experiences on the planet. 
As we learn to experience things, especially things that repeat themselves, we start to recognize that our perceptions become automatic and more habitual. And the reason for this is that perceptions that are repeated over and over again are built into what is called the subconscious mind. The subconscious mind is a database, not just of the instincts that we talked about before, but of all of our habitual learned perceptions. These are things that are stored that require no conscious processing. For example, and initially when you learned how to walk, it was actually more or less kind of a conscious effort. You were trying to stand up and identify, well, which muscles you contract and which muscles you relax to stay in balance. And to move, all of a sudden the momentum caused a different switching on and off of muscles to keep us in balance. The amount of muscles that have to be activated in just the walking process are so numerous that we can't even actually deal with them in our conscious mind. There's just too many different controls that have to be dealt with with. But this is where the benefit of the subconscious mind comes from, because once the mechanisms were acquired, the subconscious mind stores the program for walking. Now think about it. You don't have to be conscious of walking. The subconscious are automated programs that require no conscious contribution, except for the fact of the intention. If I want to go from A to B, that's the intention, and walking, of course, is the mechanism. So as I go from A to B, I don't stop and then focus on, okay, move my right leg, now move my left leg, etc. I just have the intention. The subconscious mind is a very powerful information processor and can carry out that very complex behavior. But there's a very interesting aspect about the subconscious mind, and that is it works in tandem with the third source of our perceptions, which I'll get into, called the conscious mind. The conscious mind is the creative mind. The conscious mind is the volitional mind. It's the mind that's associated with our identity of self. It's the mind that is apparently associated with our spiritual identity as well. That this is a unique mind. This is a creative mind. It's live time. It can create anything brand new. This is very different than the subconscious mind. The subconscious mind is not creative at all. Subconscious mind is the equivalent of a tape player. I record a program into the subconscious mind, and that program will play forever until I rewrite that program. The subconscious mind doesn't even have anybody in there. And this is very critical because the subconscious mind may have many, many behaviors that are actually damaging to us or destructive to us or even causing us pathologies. And there's nobody in that subconscious mind to say, oh, this behavior is good and this behavior is bad. Subconscious mind has no one. It's the equivalent, as I said, of a tape player. We recorded a behavior, and any time the stimulus shows up that is associated with that behavior, we will immediately make a playback of exactly that behavior. And the relevance about that is then, more or less, this is a self-operating mechanism once we've programmed it. And then I go back to the conscious mind. I say, yeah, but that conscious mind, that's the beautiful part of humans. That's the part that is actually connected with the concept of free will. It's the conscious mind that has the ability at any one point to observe a program behavior playing from the subconscious mind and say, stop. I want to play something very different right now. The conscious mind is powerful in that regard. But then we've also overestimated the power of that conscious mind. As a physical process, let me compare the two minds so that we understand the power and where it lies in the subconscious conscious mind subdivision. And it goes like this. The subconscious mind actually represents the operation of almost the entire brain for the simple reason is this. Consciousness was an add-on in evolution. Before consciousness existed, the brain essentially was carrying out all the functions that we attribute to the subconscious. It was a reflexive behavior. Many organisms are totally reflexive because it's a stimulus response mechanism dealt with by their brain, and they may not have conscious centers to consider why they're doing what they're doing or what they are actually doing. The subconscious mind is a million times more powerful a processor of information than is the conscious mind, the little add-on piece that becomes what we call the forebrain. And so all of a sudden I say, well, okay, if I had to compete between the power of the two minds, right away I have to recognize this. The subconscious mind is a million times more powerful than our conscious minds. And therefore, 
If I have programs in my conscious mind and programs in my subconscious mind, the tendency is the programs in the subconscious mind will overpower ultimately the programs of the conscious mind. And yet here's the interesting relationship that it requires very fundamental attention and that is this. The two minds work in tandem. The conscious mind can actually control any function in the human body. We used to think the conscious mind could only control what are called voluntary functions, like moving your arms and legs, etc. But we now know, through the work of yogis, for example, that we can control everything, even things we thought involuntary, such as blood pressure, body temperature, heartbeat. All these other kinds of things can be controlled with the conscious mind. Conscious mind can control every aspect of our humanity. Except here's the problem. The conscious mind is a limited processor. Data-wise, it's been suggested that the subconscious mind can handle about 40 million bits of data per second. And yet the conscious mind in that same second can only handle about 40 bits of data. And that's why we see the million times more powerful character of the subconscious mind when comparing the two. So the interesting aspect about this is that the two minds work in tandem. The conscious mind can control everything, but the point is this. Whatever the conscious mind is not focusing on will be managed by the subconscious mind. Well, then this becomes an issue for if we are in our conscious mind and let's say we're involved with a discussion with somebody, then the behaviors that we're carrying out that we're not paying attention to are being run by the subconscious mind. Yet we don't actually observe those behaviors because the limited power of the conscious mind is focusing my attention on the conversation and I don't even see the operation of the subconscious mind. This becomes problematic because most of us are totally oblivious to the action of the subconscious mind. And why this becomes problematic is if the subconscious mind contains perceptions or programs that do not support us, we may not even see that we are sabotaging ourselves. Let me give you a further example that may make this more palatable and easy to understand, and it will work like this. When you first got your driver's permit and you got into the car, you have no programs of how to drive a car in your subconscious mind. You haven't done it yet. So learning how to drive the car involves a conscious mind. So as you got into the car and you got the keys out and put in the ignition, you started to become very conscious of everything. The rear view mirror above your head, the side view mirrors on the doors. You started looking out the windows, the front, the back, the sides. You started looking at the gauges on the dashboard. You started to keep your attention on your feet on the pedals, the gas pedal, the clutch pedal, the brake pedal, etc. And all of a sudden you were also paying attention to the person who was sitting next to you yelling at you about your driving. And the reality, at some point, many people realize this conscious mind that processes 40 bits per second sometimes can't even handle that much information. Some people get behind the wheel and get frozen because their conscious mind can't handle all the information that's coming in at the same time. However, let's say now we've been driving for years. And so our subconscious mind has now acquired through repetition all the skills needed to learn how to drive. Well, the interesting thing is, now that you've been driving 10, 20 or so years, you get into the car, you get the key in the ignition, you're not even paying attention to that. You have someone, let's say, in the passenger seat, you're involved in a discussion. And as you're going toward your destination, you get so involved in your discussion that you as a driver at one point actually look out the window and realize you haven't paid attention to the road for the last 10 minutes. Well, don't be concerned by that because the subconscious is driving the car because your conscious mind was engaged in the discussion. And the conscious mind not being as powerful as the subconscious mind is actually even better that the subconscious mind is driving the car. It does a far better job of observing the world and handling the car than the conscious mind does. That's not the problem. The problem is this. You just drove for 10 minutes. And then I ask you, please describe your driving behavior during that 10-minute period. And then you look at me and say, but I didn't pay attention. I didn't see it. I, I was involved in a discussion. That's my point. My point is this. When the conscious mind is engaged, the subconscious mind carries out its programs, but the consciousness is generally oblivious of what those programs are. It doesn't see them because the consciousness is probably thinking of the future or thinking of the past or involved with some activity such as a conversation and not paying attention to the other behaviors that are manifesting at the same time. Most of us are totally aware that the jobs we do after they become repetitive don't require that much thinking anyway, because you can daydream while you're doing the job, and yet you're carrying out the job. And the issue, again, is you become oblivious to this. 
And one last point about the oblivious nature of the operation of the subconscious, just again to nail this home, because this becomes very critical in the rest of our discussion. And it goes like this. If you know someone and you know their parent, and you begin to realize that this person and their parent pretty much express the same behavior, and you have the audacity to actually suggest to this person, you know, you're just like your dad, or you're talking to a woman, you say, you know, you're just like your mom. These people will almost look at you horrified that how could you have made such a conclusion? I am not my mom. I am not my dad. I don't behave anything like them. Aha. How come they didn't see the behavior that the outside person saw? And the answer was simply as we described before. Because in their conscious mind, they are indeed different than their parent. They are a different identity, a different spiritual connection. They have different beliefs and attitudes about life. Yet the reality is, the behavior they're playing in their subconscious mind is the same behavior that they acquired from their parents. As they're playing this behavior, they're not observing it. And that is the whole point of this discussion that our conscious mind may have great intentions and our subconscious mind is usually running the show. And it does so with behaviors that are not necessarily the same as those provided by our conscious mind. And when we try to understand the nature of this, we say, well, where did we get these behaviors from, these perceptions, our ability to respond to life that we're not paying attention to? And it was already clear in my last example, from your parents. And why this becomes important, because now what we recognize is this, that yes, the nervous system already has incorporated instincts as perceptual responses built in when you're born. But once the brain begins to develop, it starts to read the environment, interpret the environment, and make responses. And so once you are beginning to develop and your brain gets past a certain stage of development, you are actually beginning to download perceptions responses to the environment that adjust your behavior. But these perceptions are actually downloaded into the subconscious mind. And many of them, when we express them, we don't even observe them. So it's really interesting that we talked about these three sources of perceptions, instincts, subconscious learned experience, and conscious creations. And the reason why these become important is instincts represent nature, as I mentioned. They came with us with our genes. Subconscious learned experience represents nurture. Nurture means perceptions acquired from our life experiences. And so the subconscious mind has two sets of programs, the ones from nature and the ones from nurture. And it's interesting because over the century, scientists have argued back and forth, which is more powerful, nature, nurture, nurture, nature, etc. And in fact, in the last number of years, as the gene theory has overwhelmed us, we've really given up nurture and deferred to nature saying that we're controlled by our genes and our biochemistry and that nurture has very little to offer in this regard. And it's interesting because while people are arguing nature and nurture, everyone really left out of the argument the third source of perceptions, consciousness. And why this is important is because in the argument of which is more powerful, nature and nurture, consciousness makes that a moot issue. The reason? Consciousness is more powerful than either nature or nurture for this reason. Let's say I acquired some behaviors in my nurture experiences that are not really good for me. With consciousness, I can override nurture. We also now recognize that since genes are controlled by epigenetic mechanisms, which are mediated by perception, then through my conscious perceptual experiences, I can even rewrite my genes. So it's interesting because the argument of nurture and nature gives way to the reality of the dominance of consciousness. And yet, as I mentioned, consciousness is an add-on option in our human evolution. And in fact, most people don't even exercise that particular option. They live their lives mostly through the programs of repetition. They do the same thing every day, repeating it day by day, and their head is usually lost in the fog, dreaming of the future, thinking of the past. And yet the reality is if your conscious mind is not in the present moment, but then according to the relationship of conscious and subconscious, the tandem relationship, if the conscious mind's not paying attention, then everything is run by the subconscious mind. Yeah, but as I said, w when did we start getting these perceptions that constitute our subconscious experiences? And the answer is, we started in utero.
that as we were developing as a group of cells forming the fetus, the fetus started responding to environmental information as any living organism does. Every cell responds to the environment. Every community of cells responds to the environment. So the fetus is responding to the environment. But then you might ask, well, what environment does the fetus respond to? Of course, the mother's environment, because it's in utero, it's encased in a placenta inside the mother. And so the fetus doesn't have a direct access to the external world, the environment of the outside, to know what's going on. And yet nature deemed the environment very relevant in controlling genes and behavior. So in that regard, it's very interesting that nature provides information of that environment to the developing fetus for a simple reason. The fetus having information of the environment that the mother experiences can adjust its biology, its behavior, and its genes to fit the environment that the mother experiences. And the reason why this is necessary is because when that baby is born, it's going to live in the same environment that the mother experiences. So in the process, the baby is picking up information about the environment via the mother. Now, how this occurs is the placenta. Well, conventional OBGYNs consider the role of the mother in the development of the child as nothing more than the person who nourishes the fetus, and that's why they really restrict their information about a mother's contribution to her developing child to questions of, well, are you eating well? Are you taking vitamins and minerals? Are you exercising? All these questions are really just asking, are you providing the proper nutrition to this fetus? And the reason why the questions are so limited to the nutrition is that the conventional belief of modern science is genetic determinism, as I mentioned before. And since the fetus is a conceptus comprised of the genes of the mother and the father, we all have felt that the genes control development. And as a result, the role of the mother is really nothing more than to provide the nutrition. All the rest of it would be genetically determined. But as we're beginning to find out, that belief system is totally flawed, that the genes, in fact, are really responsive to the environmental situations, that now then we understand that, then we go back to the mother's situation and we say, is the mother just providing nutrition? Well, that question could be easily answered by asking this question. Is nutrition the only thing that's carried in the mother's blood? And the answer, of course, is no. In the mother's blood are chemicals that relate to emotion. In the mother's blood are molecules that relate to control and regulation, the hormones. And why is this relevant? Because at the placenta, yes, nutrition is passed from the mother's blood to the fetus. But we also now recognize at the same time, so is information. The chemicals of emotion are passed. The hormones regulating physiology are passed through the placenta and affect the child as well. And it's interesting because they have the same targets in the fetus as these chemicals have in the mother. So if the mother is feeling anger, the emotional chemistry of anger crosses the placenta, so does the child feel anger. If the mother is feeling apprehensive, the child is feeling apprehensive. And all of a sudden we start to find there's a direct connection between the mother's experiences or perceptions of her world and the experiences and perceptions that are downloaded into the fetus. Again, this becomes very important in changing the status of the fetus, this pre-knowledge of the world before the fetus enters the real world. I refer to this as, uh, as the mother, in this case, as being nature's head start program because it's giving information about the environment to the fetus. The mother is not alone in this process by any means. The father forms a dynamic duo because it is actually the relationship between the mother and the father. That information is really what's shared with the fetus. So if the father messes up, that changes the mother's perceptions and her emotions and attitudes, which then impacts the child. So we should be very aware of this, that we started to get a lot of information about the environment even before we were born. Many of us started to get downloads of information that we weren't even wanted, for example. If the child was derived from a pregnancy that was not expected or planned, and the parents feel, oh my goodness, how can we support this child? Already the child, through the emotions of the mother and the chemistry of her physiology, is already gathering that information as well. We are not born at blank slate. We were already born with programs established for us. That, for example... A father can talk through the abdominal wall of a mother carrying a fetus. And as a fetus starts to hear the father, if the father repeats this pattern, then when the baby is born and the father opens his mouth, as soon as the father said a word, the baby knows exactly which one the father is. It already downloaded that information.
people even play music to a developing fetus and recognize that when the baby is born, it will respond to the specific music that was played at that time. So the interesting thing is this, that the mother's in perception of the environment influences the development and behavior of the fetus even before it's born. In fact, it can profoundly change the physiological character of the fetus for this reason. Consider the possibility that the mother is under stress and then realize that the stress hormones that are going through the mother's biology and affecting her physiology cross the placenta and have the same impact on the child. And when we take that into consideration, remember the, the fact that was also stated that blood carries nourishment, that in the development of a fetus, the more blood a tissue gets, the more it will develop. It's directly proportional. So now let's take the scenario that a woman is carrying a child and she lives in a stressful environment. And what do we find? Well, number one, the stress hormones cause her visceral blood vessels to constrict and force the blood to the periphery. Number two, we find that the blood vessels in the forebrain of her uh, central nervous system, these blood vessels constrict and push the blood to the hindbrain to activate reflex behavior. Now let's put ourselves in the place of a fetus inside of this woman, crossing the placenta of the same stress hormones. And in this fetus now the blood is also being directed to the same places as they were in the mother. So in the developing fetus, the blood is now preferentially running to the arms and legs. Yeah, but the more blood the arms and legs have, the bigger they get. So all of a sudden, this fetus starts to get a larger physical body. In addition, the blood flow in the brain is not equally distributed. The blood flow is restricted in the forebrain and enhanced in the hindbrain, which means in this developing fetus, the hindbrain is getting bigger and bigger. But at what expense? The answer is the forebrain is not growing as well. And the difference between the two brains is hindbrain's reflective, forebrain is consciousness and executive logic. And what that really represents is, what is the consequence on this fetus whose mother is experiencing a stressful world? And the answer is, when this fetus is born, it's going to have an extra large body in regard to arms and legs. Its visceral organs are not going to be as fully developed as they should be. Its hindbrain is going to have tremendous reflex capabilities to operate that large body but its forebrain is going to be significantly smaller. In fact, it is found that up to 52% of a child's intelligence based on the development of its forebrain is a variable based on the conditions that occur in prenatal developmental periods. And so all of a sudden you start to see that the mother's attitudes can profoundly change the physiology and biology of her child, as well as any pattern that is repeated will be learned by the system. So as the baby is born, it's already templated with emotions and physical characters derived from the mother's response to the environment. This is a very key, important fact for it says this, parents act as genetic engineers. The child is not determined by the genes it's received. It is greatly influenced by the environment in which it develops because perception applies to the fetus as much as it applies to the mother. So all of a sudden we start to recognize that we start getting perceptions even before we're born, that even some of our behavior is profoundly affected by this. It's now even recognized that even the stresses of the birthing process are downloaded into the subconscious memory and that throughout life, patterns of the stressful birthing process can repeat themselves in the adult life, interfering with our lives 40 years down the road. So all of a sudden we now recognize this. The fetus is in a continuous state of learning from midway pregnant through pregnancy and onwards. We used to think that the fetal brain really wasn't downloading any information until just near birth, and then there was a tremendous spurt of activity and the brain starts to develop from birth on. We now know that this is totally incorrect. We now recognize that midway through pregnancy on, the nervous system is actually beginning to download perceptions of the world that we live in. And then once we're born, we start to acquire perceptions very, very rapidly. And that is because the fetal brain, when it matures into the baby's brain after birth, is designed to respond to the environment in a different way than our brains do. When you look at an adult brain and you look at the electrical activity of the brain, which is a reflection of brain function, we call this electrical activity an electroencephalograph when we record it. We can put wires on your head and read your brain activity. And what's interesting, in adult, we have the complete range of activity. We have high levels of activity and low levels of activity and everything in between.
However, when we look at a baby that's just born, we realize it's not capable of expressing the whole range of EEG activities. That a baby starts out for the first two years in the lowest level of activity called delta, which in an adult is usually associated with unconsciousness or sleeping. Yet the fetus is not unconscious or sleeping. The fetus has not fully developed its nervous system, so its muscle coordination, its output parts aren't it really integrated. So the first couple of years of its life, it's easily taking information in, but not able to respond. And as a result, the child is more or less like behind a plate glass window, observing the world and not able to respond to it while it's in delta. When a child reaches two until about the age of six or seven, the child's brain is predominantly in the next higher level of activity called theta. Theta is a state of imagination, state of creation, in fact. Very interestingly, when adults are in that stage uh, of theta, when their brain is in that, that level, it's usually referred to as twilight reverie. It is the activity of the brain just as we're beginning to wake up, coming out of sleep and before being fully awake, or the activity of the brain just as we're going asleep and we're not fully asleep. In these two states of twilight reverie, the individual can actually mix the real world with the dream world. So, for example, upon awakening, if you have an, a radio alarm clock and the radio turns on before you awake and you're in a dream, you can actually begin to mix the contents of the radio show with your dream and mix the real world with the imaginary dream world, and that's twilight reverie. Well, it's interesting because this is the predominant state of a child between two and six years of age. During this period of life, the child is mixing the real life world with the fantasy world. So when a child makes mud pies, it's not mud, it's actually a pie. When they're riding a broom and calling it a horse, to them, it actually is a horse. They're in that middle world of dream world and real world. And they live through that world through the first six years of life. By about seven the child begins to ramp up and be in a more predominant state called alpha, which is a higher activity. Alpha is the EEG activity associated with calm consciousness. So that essentially consciousness becomes a, a character of the child's life after it's six years of age and onwards. And by 12, the child then ramps up to the even higher level of beta activity, which is focused schoolroom kind of consciousness. The relevance of all this is for the first six years of a child's life, it is in predominantly delta and theta activity. These are very low levels of VEG activity. Interestingly, these are the activity levels associated with hypnosis. And it appears then that a child is in a hypnotic trance for the first six years of its life. And during that hypnotic trance, it doesn't have to be taught like schoolroom teaching. All the child has to do is observe and experience, and everything will be downloaded. The intelligence of the child is very, very active at this point. And in fact, a child, let's say at three years of age, can learn three languages simultaneously as discrete individual uh, languages with their own vocabulary and grammar and syntax, etc. And yet when a child gets to be eight or nine, it doesn't have that ability to do three languages at the same time. In fact, it's even hard to learn one new language at that point. What that really represents is that a child is in a state of super learning for the first six years of its life, but it's not being conscious of yet. It's just downloading what it observes, what it hears, what it sees, what it smells. Its perceptions of the world are downloaded. If it's a male child, it will focus on its father and observe how its father responds to the stimuli of the world and how the father's behavior is programmed. As a male, it would look at the mother and see how a woman would relate to this father. And in the program, this young male will actually gather an idea of the kind of woman that he will actually look for when he's older. In contrast, if, if the child is female, she will really focus on the mother and see how she responds to the stimuli, see how she responds to the father. The kids will see how parents talk to other kids and how they talk to adults. It's completely different. And that when a, an adult talks to a policeman, it's even different than when he talks to other adults. All of this occurring within the first six years, the child learns all the nuances of life. For me, it's always humorous when I reflect back on my own children. When the first time they used a swear word, which apparently I've been using, for me, it was always funny for this reason. When they use a swear word, they didn't use it out of context. They used it in such perfect nuance that you knew exactly what they were talking about and what they exactly meant. So we learn more than just the word. We learn all about the word and even how to say words and how the nuances of words are very important. All of this before we're really even conscious.
This is the programmable life of perceptions. This enables us to fit into society very, very quickly because we can download all the rules without even consciously thinking about them. We're just being hypnotized by the world that we live in. It's here where we acquire our perceptions of life. And it's here where we can also acquire our misperceptions of life. So, for example, if I'm in my backyard as an infant and I see my first snake and I point to it and my mother sees it and she's with me and she's deathly afraid of snakes, she sees the snake and yells, snake, grabs me by the arm and yanks me out of the backyard to protect me. I've just acquired a perception, a download, a hypnosis. It says this organism is called snake and snake is dangerous. The significance of downloading this information is the next time I see a snake, I already have a subconscious program to deal with it. I see a snake, I yell snake and run like crazy to protect my life. Well, it's interesting because if I go back to that scenario and find that the snake slithered from my backyard into my neighbor's backyard, and in that backyard there was another young person with their mother, but their mother happens to be a herpetologist, let's say. And as this garden snake slithers into view, the mother says, Oh, look at this. This is a garden snake. And then holds the snake for the child and then hands the child the snake and describes how beautiful and wonderful the snake is. This child has a perception of snake, but it is totally different in regard to the perception of snake that I received just moments ago. So when this child sees a snake in the future, rather than getting excited and running, this child will say, wow, that's real interesting. Let me be curious of the snake. So interesting point is two children, same stimulus, totally different perceptions, meaning that in our later lives, we will respond very different to what we just learned. So what we're beginning to recognize is this. We acquire our ability to respond to the world that we live in, not from our own personal experiences, but by downloading the experiences of others around us that we might refer to as our teachers, that we buy their experiences. And those are the experiences of how to deal with life that are downloaded into our subconscious. And these are the ones that will operate from the big process of the subconscious mind. Now, why this becomes important very simply is this. When I am operating my day-to-day -day life, I have always held the belief that I'm operating my life in harmony and agreement with the thoughts that penetrate my conscious thinking. And yet now we find something new. Neuroscientists are telling us of a surprising piece of data, and it goes like this, that anywhere from 95 and perhaps more closely 99% of the day, we operate from the subconscious mind, the more powerful mind of the two. And that 5% or less, probably just 1% of the day, we're actually controlling the lives with our own intentions and desires and beliefs that we actually entertain in our conscious mind. The significance is, is that when the conscious mind is busy thinking about things or engaged in some kind of activity such as a conversation, all the rest of the programming comes from the subconscious mind. Well, now we stand back and say, well, wait a minute. Most of the programming of the subconscious mind wasn't derived from us. It was patterned by other people that were around us when we were growing up. It's not even our own behavior. It may not even support what we would like to do. But do we even observe it when we express its behavior? And that's when I say, no, go back and remember this. The two minds work in tandem, and we're generally oblivious of the action of the subconscious mind. So this is why people, when they look at the world, get very frustrated and concerned, thinking, but this is what I want in my world. I want a wonderful relationship. I want to be healthy. I want to have excitement. I want to have joy. All the great things that these are things that I want. Well, let's look at it that this is a conscious intention and a conscious desire. But if this person comes from a dysfunctional family, then the reality is, while they're even thinking these thoughts of what they want, the subconscious mind is then carrying out the behavior. But the behavior it's carrying out is not the behavior associated with the conscious mind's intentions and wishes. It's a behavior that's just a replay of the teachers that they learn from, which may be totally self-sabotaging. And in fact, again, that's when you go back and you talk to that person and you say, you know, you're just like your parent. And to them, they're like, how could you even say that? And the reason, again, is they're fully oblivious of the programs in the subconscious. Well, what kind of programs that can we get in the subconscious that actually will interfere with us? 
And this is the interesting part because you're familiar with them already. You've already seen kids getting programmed with thoughts that are sabotaging and detrimental. I'll give you a couple examples. For example, let's say you're in a busy department store and the parents are pushing a shopping cart around and behind them is a little toddler who is grabbed onto some toy and now throwing a tantrum. Mommy, mommy, I want this toy. I want this toy. For a moment, stop and listen to what the parents say to this child, especially if they're frustrated and they really want to get out of the store. They really make it short and sweet, something like, you don't deserve that toy. Now, come on, let's get up and we're leaving. And these kind of things are said to a child. You're not good enough for that. You don't deserve. Things that children hear when they're less than six are not thought about in their conscious mind. Their conscious mind's not even really working at that time. That's alpha consciousness. They're just directly downloading into the subconscious. What do they download? You were probably downloaded with the same thing. I was downloaded with things like this. Who do you think you are? You're not smart enough. You're not good at X or you're not good at Y. You're a sickly child. You don't deserve things. Well, when we hear those and we're less than six, remember this. We don't have to have an education. We just have an immediate download. The immediate download goes into the subconscious. The subconscious is a habit player. It will play that habit, not just when we're kids. We'll play it until the day we die. So now look at yourself. Let's say you're 40 years old and you came from that particular family where it was in the department store. And your conscious mind is now reviewing the current status of your life and not very satisfied with it, thinking, my goodness, I work so hard. I'm smarter than the rest of the other people on the job. I'm not getting as paid as much as I should. I should even be the boss of my section. How come I'm not getting that? And of course, the immediate thought is because the universe and the conditions of the world aren't offering it. I'm a victim. Things are out of my control. I just don't get them for whatever number of reasons. And I can give you a whole list of reasons. And yet the truth is, they didn't get the position because that was a child that was repeatedly programmed the belief, you do not deserve things. And why is this relevant? Because 95 to 99% of the day, this processor, the subconscious mind, a million times more powerful than the processor called the conscious mind, is playing the same program over and over again. You do not deserve, you do not deserve, habitually playing that program. And all of a sudden, that would cause us to engage in behaviors to make that belief coherent. In other words, I cannot engage in a behavior that will reward me because if I get rewarded and I have a program saying I do not deserve, that's a conflict. It won't work. So what the subconscious mind will do will engage in programs and behaviors to be assuring of the fact that in the end, I won't get something because I don't deserve it. Now, why this becomes a problem is that there's a tendency to believe that there's actually something or someone in the subconscious mind. So that as we become aware of information, we think, ah, now that I understand this about my life, I will be different. So, for example, people go to cognitive therapy and they say, let's review the history of your life, all your experiences. And they go back over every hurting thing that you've ever felt in your life. Every time you were rejected, every time you lost, you go over all those events and you relive them again. Interesting fact, you actually re-experience them. Your whole physiology re-experiences those original things. And now, all of a sudden, after so many years of cognitive therapy, you sit down and you're very proud and you say, yeah, I spent $60,000 and I know every event that caused my life to be the way it is. My parents did this. My girlfriend did that. My friends did this. I make a whole list of them. I'm totally aware of them. And guess what? My behavior is still the same as it was before. And what's the problem? And the problem is this. Somehow or other, we've held a belief that if my conscious mind becomes aware of something, that will automatically correct the data in my subconscious mind. But this is a failure. It's an error for the simple reason. The subconscious mind doesn't have anybody in it. It's a tape player. The idea of trying to change the tape player by talking to it can be uh, expressed in a simple example. I give you a tape. You go home, put it in your tape player. You push the play button. You start to listen to the program and decide you don't like that program. So what do you do? You go up to the tape player and have a discussion with it. Say, you know, this is really not a good program. I wish you would play something different. Maybe you could play something like this or something like that. And as you start talking and talking and talking, you realize, 
I'm talking to this tape player for a long time, and guess what? It's still playing the same tape. And the reality, all of a sudden, you start to recognize is that it's not listening to you. So then you get mad. You get mad at yourself, and you start yelling at yourself, damn it, why can't you do things better? Because now you're talking to yourself to get the program to, to run better, and now you're arguing with yourself, and you're yelling at yourself, and you're berating yourself. And the reality is, who are you talking to? Not the subconscious mind. That might be your intention, but the unfortunate part is that subconscious mind's a tape player. Nobody's in there to even listen to your argument. The reality is, it falls on deaf ears. And after you get finished getting mad at yourself, then you're really left with the last thing, and then at that point, you really start asking God to come in and change the tape player. And the issue about that is, no, it will not happen that way. The tape player is a very important device. It was not our enemy. The tape player was actually an adjunct to our consciousness in this regard. Because if all the programs were run in there correctly, then I wouldn't have to pay attention to the things in my life like I don't now anyway. But the programs that are in there would actually lead me to a successful end. I mean, think about it this way. If you happen to be a child in a family, and this family was an aware family, a conscious family, a very loving family, a family that worked on a win-win basis, that understood balance and harmony in nature, and lived their lives that way, and treated each other with respect and love, and everything that we would think is the, the most wonderful family relationship. If you were an infant born into that family, that would be the program in your subconscious mind. You know what's interesting about that? That individual can grow up and not pay attention to anything in the world. They can spend their entire life daydreaming, and that person will end up on the top of the pile. Why? Because when they're not paying attention, every program in their subconscious mind would be leading them to very positive, satisfactory kinds of conclusions. But that, unfortunately, is a very rare exception. Almost all of us were brought up with dysfunctional relationships where our parents didn't have appropriate relationships. Their responses to the environment were not really fully supportive or encouraging of health or resolution. And that their information sent to us from them about who we are, whether we were smart or pretty or not smart or not pretty and not able to do things and not able to earn things or not be worthy of things and who do we think we are these kind of the programs when when we get these programs in our subconscious when we're not paying attention those are the programs that are playing so now we come to this very very important conclusion and it comes to this we're not biological automatons controlled by genes where all of our programs are manifest at the moment of conception and the rest of our life is just playing out the programs of the genes this is not true at all that we are dynamic individuals that we live in the world and biological organisms are capable of adapting to almost any kind of environment the reason why they're capable of adapting is they're not genetically programmed that the programs of the genes can change and be modified by the experiences of the individual and the experiences offered by the environment that through the perception of the living organism the perception can adjust the biology but well, a single cell has very basic, simple perceptual abilities. A cell can see if calcium is there or histamine or estrogen. When we get to the level of a human, we have a brain filled with trillion cells that lies between the world that we see and experience and the internal world of our biology. The function of the brain is perception. It's to read the world and then adjust the biology. And why this becomes relevant is then we have a nervous system whose function it is to learn the experiences of life, acquire perceptions, and then guide our biology and our health through the world as we grow and mature. And yet now we recognize that that nervous system has two parts, the subconscious and the conscious. We also recognize that the conscious is totally creative, yet the subconscious, the more powerful of the pair, is also the one that runs from 95 to 99 percent of the time. So our lives are actually the printout of the programs in our subconscious mind more than it is the printout of programs we would envision with our conscious mind. What's very interesting about that is do we have to go back and find out who programmed what and where into us and relive all those experiences? And the answer is absolutely not because the message from all those messengers, the people who brought us the experiences are the messengers, the message is what's in the subconscious mind. While cognitive therapy has a tendency to go kill the messenger over the message, it's not relevant who the messengers were. It's not even relevant to go back and identify when and how they occurred. The simple reason is this. 
because whatever we learned is operating present time out of the subconscious mind right now, and that our lives reflect the program in the subconscious mind. Well, we used to think of our deficits and the wants and needs and desires as being something we weren't able to obtain because we were more or less victims of the world and we just couldn't get there. The new understanding of biology says if there was any victimization, it occurred within the subconscious mind. It was not the universe. The universe will offer you anything. So the interesting reality is if you look at your life, you can already see the things you are missing generally reflect programs that won't allow you to get there, that your subconscious is already imbued with these programs of deficit. And so the interesting point is, okay, Bruce, you finally got me there. I got to see how I got programmed and then I bought other people's beliefs and that these other beliefs are running my life 95 to 99% of the time. But then you told me the program is a habit. It's a tape player and talking to the tape player doesn't change it. Now the question very clearly is, what can I do in the circumstance when I realize that the programs that I'm employing are not providing the life that I would really like? How can I change the programs? And the interesting answer is there are many different ways to change the programs. But talking to your subconscious mind is not one of the ways because, as I said, no one is in there. So the interesting thing about talking to the subconscious mind is how can you get that information to be incorporated in the subconscious mind? What you actually have to do is a process, a process that would be tantamount to pushing the record button on the tape player that's playing the tape. So as you push the record button, what you put in now is going to rewrite the program. Well, how can you re-record the program? At first, when I started to come upon this information, I actually had no idea how to record the program. And it used to be very upsetting because I'd close my lecture with this really wonderful mechanistic understanding that we are program devices and our lives reflect the programs. And then, of course, it was a big letdown for the audience because at the very end, the first question is, well, okay, tell me how to change the program. And I used to sort of back away saying, well, you know, I, I can tell you about how the program works. I, I'm not familiar with it. So there was one point when I was giving lectures about how if you understand this new biology, you can create a life that's the equivalent of living in heaven on this planet right now, something I firmly believe. And when I was giving this, I'd also noticed that the people in the audience were a little bit unsure and skeptical about my advice that this could happen because they looked at me and they thought, for a guy who apparently knows all this stuff, your life doesn't look that great, Lipton. And that was when I started to realize that I would respond to them almost saying, and I'm glad I didn't say it, but essentially I said it was, well, do as I say, not as I do. Because I realized at some point is like, well, I'm talking about how you can have a great life and my life wasn't that great. And then all of a sudden it really dawned on me, said, my goodness, I'm just, I have conscious awareness of all the mechanisms, but my subconscious is completely programmed by other beliefs than the ones I just acquired. And so even though I acquired all this new awareness, I'm still operating from the habitual tapes from my childhood. So I started to try to pay attention to what can I do about that? And I started listening to the voices that run through our heads when we're, we're doing things. So for example, when you're driving the car and you, let's say you come to the stoplight and you're waiting for the light, you can hear a dialogue going on in your head. Basically, it's tapes playing from the subconscious mind. And as psychologists tell us, about 70% or more of those tapes that are playing are negative and redundant. So when you get a moment, if you can hear some of those thoughts, just tune in every now and say, what am I thinking? Listen to them. Most of these kinds of thoughts are, oh, that will never work. Oh, that can't happen. Oh, I can't get that. These are almost all negating the, the things that we were looking for. And if you start to hear thoughts that are negating the direction you're going, then you'll have to recognize this, that that powerful processor, that million times more powerful processor called the subconscious mind, operating 95 to 99% of the time with programs that say I won't get it, will actually end up providing me with things that I didn't want things that I couldn't get the things I wanted because my mind wouldn't even allow them to come in. So when I started to listen to these, I started to recognize that in the process, I could actually hear something uh, like a, a negative thing like, oh, that's not going to happen. And then I would consciously say, no, wait, that's not true. It can happen. I can get this. And I started to realize that if you become conscious of these thoughts, you can actually interact with them as they're being manifest and change them live time. Well, what happens is if you continuously do this process through a, a something equivalent to habituation, you can lead to a rewriting 
of the of these codes. Now, but there's a problem with that, and that is, in the world that we live in, with so much activity and the speed of life that we go by, we really don't have at our fingertips the ease and comfort of sitting back to listen and communicate with our thoughts. So it's very hard to do this. This process, I later found out, was called Buddhist mindfulness being mindful, being conscious all the time. And that alone is really where the power is for the simple reason. The conscious mind has all the wishes and aspirations and desires that you want for your life. If you stay conscious and stop daydreaming and stop thinking about the past and the future and be here now, then you are actually running the machine live with the intentions that you like. But the moment life starts to get busy and all of a sudden you start thinking about things and contemplating the past or the future, then you automatically start operating off of the mind that has the programs that do not support you. So Buddhist mindfulness is a way of getting there, but it's really difficult for most people to use that because of the time and the investment it takes to pay attention to your thoughts. So I later found there was another way that was very effective, and that would be clinical hypnosis. And the reason for why that is effective is simply is that that is the same state in which the subconscious was programmed originally. We were below alpha wave activity. Uh, we were in more or less theta wave activity, and theta is the hypnagogic trance. So I can go back into a hypnotic trance through a clinical hypnotherapist who can help me slow down my conscious thoughts, allow me to get into the hypnagogic state, and then reprogram the, the uh, beliefs that were loaded into my subconscious mind. That is a very effective way as well. And lastly, there is now a whole variety of modalities that are collectively referred to as energy psychology. And the significance of energy psychology is that it's not cognitive therapy at all. It actually just deals with the energy in the field. It involves characteristics associated with super learning, the ability to open up the brain and download information at rates of speed that are just phenomenal. And the relevance about all that is that using these varieties of different modalities of energy psychology, many of them have letters like EFT, TFT, EMDR, some of them are sort of body talk is one form, avatar is another, psych K is the one that I work with. Uh, these are a variety of modalities that allow us to impact the program in the subconscious using an energy process wherein we can change beliefs that have limited us our whole lives, 50, 60 years, change a belief in about 10 minutes or so and walk away a completely different person as a consequence of this. So basically what it really says is we start to get into a new understanding of who we really are. We are not the genes we are not the physical body. We are the mind inside the system. The mind, via the perceptions, control every aspect of our biology, our behavior, and our genes. And that we must understand that if we experience problems in the world that we live in today, it's not because there's generally something wrong with us and our biology. It's almost inevitably associated with there's something wrong with our programming and our belief about who we are and why we are on this planet. Because if we begin to understand this nature, if we begin to understand that we can reprogram ourselves, we can free ourselves from the past, we can free ourselves from the limitation, we can change our health by changing our mind. I mean, the best example of something like that is consider the people who are laying on their deathbed, terminal cancer, everybody writing them off, thinking it's too late, they're gone. And all of a sudden, this person gets up and says, I'm not buying this. I don't care about, if I only have a short time left and I'm going out there and I'm going to live the life that I wanted to live, not the one that I was programmed to live. And it's interesting because these are the people when they get up off of that deathbed and they actually change the style of their life are the ones that express what is called a spontaneous remission. They change their perceptions. Their perceptions change their biology. This is not an unusual thing. Many of you are actually very familiar with a pathology associated with that called multiple personalities. Interesting about multiple personalities, these are people that have a pathology in a sense where they actually switch from one personality into another personality. What's very interesting about this, while they are, of course, neurological switches that occur as they go from one personality to the other, 
almost every time there are also physiological and physical characteristics that switch at the very same time. That in personality A, they could have brown eyes, and in personality B, they can have gray eyes, and this changes in about a minute or so. That in personality A, they can have an anaphylactic response, let's say, to dogs. And then a minute later, when they switch into personality B, they could play in a whole pile of dogs and never have a problem with it. But you switch them right back to A, and then one dog will cause an anaphylactic response. And so basically what we recognize is as people change their personality, they also accommodate the changes by changing their physiology and their physical selves as well. Well, this is a pathology and not a lot of people are interested in that, but how about real life issues like, ah, actors. Actors are interesting in this regard because when they take on a character, they also acquire the personality to play the character. And the better the actor they are, the more the personality takes over their lives. Some actors can gain 40 pounds for a role, and then as soon as the role is over, lose 40 pounds. Some actors could be thin and frail and then play somebody like Cassius Clay in a movie, and the next time you see them, you'll see them and say, oh my God, look at the physical build on this guy. And then the last movie I saw him in, he was a skinny little rail. And all this came about from what reason? The ability to take on the personality, change the personality in their life, and operate their body from a different personality led to a different biology. All of these examples are very clear and positive examples uh, of how the mind controls biology. This includes what we call the placebo effect. The placebo effect is a person is sick and is given a pill wherein the doctor says this is the newest, most effective pill for what you have. It's just out of the research labs. You're really going to love this pill. And the doctor gives them the pill and they get better, only later to find out that the pill was really nothing more than sugar or chalk that there wasn't anything in there except for the belief. And it's interesting because it's now found that the minimum 35 to 40 percent of any drug's action is directly related to the placebo effect. And what to me is very interesting is while the drug companies actually want to eliminate the placebo effect, I'm still really questioning as to why aren't we enhancing the placebo effect? Why don't we leverage our perception to work with us and to heal us rather than trying to fake ourselves out? change our belief systems is what it's all about. And interesting, while the placebo effect represents an example of a positive belief that leads to a positive conclusion, there's an also equally powerful but oppositely directed effect called the nocebo effect. The nocebo effect is when someone tells you something bad news or some limitation that all of a sudden becomes yours because they told you that. And when you start to recognize that as well, good news can heal you, bad news can make you sick. People can actually die just because of the belief of bad news. People can generate issues of physiology that are not really manifest for any other reason than their belief system because they expect to. And all of a sudden, we again, we start to really dabble into what is powerful in the world that we live in. Is it the physical machine? Is it the biochemistry, the genes, as the medical profession would have us believe, especially as the drug company would have us believe, because they sell us drugs to fix up who we are. And yet the reality is the new biology says it's completely different than anything we ever thought before, because we are not a genetic automaton. We are a device controlled by perception, and we control perception. And by doing that, we can control the lives that we have. Today we live in a world that is on the brink of destruction. There are crises in every area of the world that we look at. Healthcare, people, governments, the ecology, everything is in a strange upheaval. And it turns out the scientists have recognized that the extinction that we are facing on the world right now is not due to anything other but our human behavior. And basically it says for us to survive we have to change our behavior. I personally am very familiar with this because having been there in the 1970s and starting to recognize that the conventional belief of genes controlling life was really wrong, that environment was important, I started to recognize that if I changed my perception of the environment, that I would change the life I lead. And it's interesting because I sit here today telling you this information only from the enthusiasm of a guy who has experienced it. My life was nothing that I would have loved to claim before. And yet today, at this very moment, I sit here talking to you, telling you, if there is a heaven, I firmly believe it is here on this planet right now. Because the life that I'm leading with my new perceptions of the fact that the universe supports me and loves me, and I find that in the community of life, I now have a completely different life on this planet 
I didn't take any drugs or chemicals for this. It was basically an understanding of changing our perceptions, our beliefs about life. It's belief that is powerful. I wasn't raised in the Christian tradition, and yet I refer back to the master teacher, Jesus. And he was the man who said, you could renew your life with your beliefs. I fully see that now as a scientific fact. And it's important because he said you can do all of the miracles that he could do, even better than he can do, but he said you didn't believe. And that, again, is the truth. So what I leave you with is a little piece of advice, and you hope you will follow it, and that is recognize this. The world fully supports who we are. If there are any problems, it's usually from acquired from other people who had put us down and taken away power from us that you are fully powerful to do all the miracles that Jesus talked about, but you have to believe so. To believe so, you have to find out what programs in your subconscious mind are not supporting you and begin to change those programs into programs that encourage your vitality, your health, your life, your prosperity, and your love on this beautiful planet called Earth. Thank you. This concludes The Biology of Belief with Dr. Bruce Lipton. Music by Stephen McNamara. Thank you for listening. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.